to convene this regular meeting of the city council at 540. Is that what it says? 536. First item of the agenda is the agenda. Is there a motion? Council question. Yes, I'm going to move to amend and adopt the agenda as follows. Um, note of uh, Appendix A for Consent Agenda Item 6.16, Report Cemetery Commission for Holly Bushnell for Councilor Bushnell. That's the attendance record. Note written material for Agenda Item 2.10, Work Session regarding discussion of possible uses of BT proceeds per COS Rydell. Removed from the agenda item, um, from the agenda item 7.05, public hearing regarding Burlington's comprehensive development ordinance, ZA 19-03 parking per Councilor Mason. Removed from the agenda item 7.06, comprehensive development ordinance parking amendments, ZA number 19-03, planning department, planning commission ordinance committee, second reading per Councilor Mason. Note revised version of agenda item 7.09, resolution use of proceeds from the sale of Burlington Telecom to purchase eight sidewalk tractors. Mayor Weinberger and President uh, Wright, um, sorry, I just lost my, my place here, per CAO Anderson. Note final amended version of the communication for this agenda item per Chapin Spencer. Remove from the consent agenda item 6.27 resolution authorization to enter into a contract with urban offsets and for the creation of a reserve fund for the revenue generated by the sale of carbon offsets to support the city's tree and conservation programming board of finance and place it on the deliberative agenda as item 7.10 for Councillor Hansen. This agenda item has been removed and will be part of the August 12th City Council Deliberative Agenda per CIO Lowe, per City Council President Wright. And I so move. There is, there is one other change. Do we need to, or do, was that put in here, the Board of Finance? I no changed it from Board of Finance to you, okay, the Mayor. Okay, all right, we got it. All right, so Councilor Mason, you second to that? Yes. All right, all those in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. We have our agenda. Um, the next item are work sessions that we need to have executive sessions for. Councilor, City Attorney Blackwood. I believe we're going to start with um, public session on the BT proceeds and then see how that goes and um, depending on and, and I can kind of lay out for you what we're thinking of covering and what might need to need okay. an executive session. To All right, so we'll start out with the work session. Uh, hearing from City Attorney Blackwood and the Mayor, CEO Anderson, regarding discussion, possible uses of Burlington Telecom proceeds. So the Mayor has provided a memo that lays out some uh, recommended uses of the Burlington Telecom closing proceeds and what we thought is that um, uh, Ralphine is here as well. That if that if we get into a discussion of the membership interest possibility, there that is still an issue to be negotiated with BT. And what we thought we would the the new entity um, Champlain Broadband. And what we thought is that we could go over what we, what what is already known, what is already public, and then if you wanted to get into a discussion about um, more the issues that we may yet ne want to negotiate and how we think about them and how we think about whether or not to do an interest, we should do that in executive session because openly discussing it at this point in time may negatively impact the city because of sharing it with BT, the other entity that we're negotiating with. Normally we wouldn't share our thinking about how to negotiate with the other party before we negotiate it. So we were thinking we would try to do as much of just reviewing for everybody, making sure everybody has all the basic information before we um, decided whether or not you wanted to go into executive session, how much you wanted to discuss. One of the key things that we want to know is there was some discussion before about wanting to have an outside person give some analysis and we want to get a good sense of what additional analysis we need to do. Um, for example, in response to some comments by uh, Jay Nodell, we have approached about getting, looking at projections and what those look like and 
and we wanted they want to know some detail like what exactly do you want to know and we want would like to talk about some of that we think that probably is the kind of thing we ought to do in executive session because we want to make sure that we understand what we are talking about for our negotiation with them but before that we thought we would start with going through this memo and then going over some other um, public information for example Ralphine's prepared to run through with you what has already been in nego negotiated as far as the carried interest goes so that sounds good I assume everybody's read the memo so you can maybe just give Are us you a speak to it you want that to <coughs> You want um, I'm happy to 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 kick some of it off. The, the um, I think one thing that would be um, helpful uh, is to you know um, start kind of narrowing and clarifying um, exactly uh, what funds are available to us uh, for considering. Um, in investing and so this memo tries to, to lay that out um, I won't you know repeat in detail each word words but uh, there, there are two ar areas that I'm hopeful there it's going to be broad agreement on and maybe we could uh, decide on this relatively soon which is um, the city essentially BT owes the pension system approximately 400,000 I think we've long contemplated that the sales proceeds net sales proceeds would be used to cover that liability um, uh, but I don't think we've ever kind of formally taken action on that or you know, really discussed it at length so um, maybe some discussion of that to understand where people are at um, uh, would would be helpful uh, and then similarly uh, my strong recommendation for counselors who are um, interested in seeing a successful redevelopment of Memorial Auditorium um, we don't know what that will involve. Uh, when BT was initially built, their, a, their substantial BT equipment was put in the basement of Memorial Auditorium. Um, one can envision redevelopment plans. We're leaving it there and definitely is fine. And, and there are other scenarios we're leaving it there uh, in a redevelopment scenario um, is, is really problematic. Our recommendation is that we reserve and work you know, we anticipated this issue, and, and in the negotiation, you'll recall the agreement with Schurz. Um, we have kind of uh, clarified our liability here and put a cap on it and put um, some rules in place about that cap going down under certain conditions until we've made a de decision about the future of Memorial Auditorium. Uh, my pretty strong recommendation uh, is that we reserve some of these um, uh, funds uh, in case they are needed um, to uh, address that liability that it, it is there. So maybe we could pause there for some discussion on those two items. Let's see if there's general agreement. Can I may I ask a process? Oh, sorry. Councilor Mason. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot who's running the meeting. Um, uh, are you envisioning, you know, if, if there is consensus on funding the Burr's liability in the memorial, are you anticipating doing that now and then sort of, are you thinking we're going to wait till we figure out where we're putting all the money and then uh, I'm just from an iterative process what are you looking to do um, I guess I'm not I, my my hopes for uh, decisions being made tonight are, are low um, we are uh, anticipating uh, a alternate solution to the to the uh, snowplow <coughs> issue so I don't think any decisions need to be made tonight but I think understanding kind of the, where people where the council some discussion about where the council is what I will I think be helpful in uh, shaping kind of how the process unfolds from here I mean I ask only because I think at least from my perspective I I would concur that at least going into the sale my expectation was we would fully satisfy the burrs liability and put the put aside some reserves so I would be supportive of that I'm not sure you know what the process will be in terms of the remaining balance and how long that will take so um, I look forward to that with public dialogue but I mean I agree there's greater discussion on those points can you speak to so no action tonight just is, is I know one of the things that you were pushing for was that it saves some money if we act before <coughs> August yes. 1st or whatever August yes August. we are looking so, for action tonight on the snowplows uh, 
by the time we get to that on the council agenda, um, there's a proposal for an alternative way of doing that. So, because there's clearly there's some discomfort in, uh, from a number, number of councils and using B, councilors and using BT, these BT funds to do that. So we can wait on making any commitment on BT funds tonight and still get snow plows for one. Okay. Councilor Bush. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, can we begin with what it approximately the fund is? Because that's the beginning of this process. And I just want to be clear on this. So you've got the six point, let's just call it 6.5 million, even though that's rounding up a little bit. Um, but then there's a $500,000 that hasn't been added to that amount. Is that true? It has not been added. And right, no, I understand. The city attorney said it can't be added, um, if you'd like that to. So uh, what can that five, so, so okay, well, then let me ask one more question. And then there's the million dollars that is kind of hanging out there that once everything's finalized, it may be a little bit less, but it's going to be divided between the city and city bank. So there are additional dollars. And so are those two pots of money restricted in their use? And if so, how? So that I understand yeah. really what the total amount from this venture is. And because I think that for me, it's not it's not complete until I understand yeah. that piece and then understand where we're how we're going to fund okay, each so thing. Let's hear from yeah. the mayor and or Eileen. Okay. I don't want to so great questions. They are the answer is different with each one of them. And I think it, and, the, and there's a timing issue here too that I meant to mention with respect to Councillor Mason's question. We have, the clock is ticking on us making this decision. Um, we have a year from the closing date um, to, uh, in the in the SURES agreement to, um, uh, to, to do this. And the closing date was March 12th. March 12th. So um, uh, that's the amount of time we have left. And I hope whatever process, I, I think it'd be good if we get to some process discussion um, so that we can make sure we give ourselves ample time to make a decision in that one time frame. The timing potentially matters here for one of the items. So first of all, the 500,000 of working capital, that was city money. Um, it, that was never considered utility money and it was returned to the city and there is no legal way. I'm sure Eileen could expand upon that if you, you'd like, but it, the short of it is that money is not utility money and is therefore not um, something we can consider investing in in the BT equity. The and has that been, so did that get returned, Mr. Mayor, already? And has that been invested somewhere or not? It's essentially part of our unassigned fund balance at this point. Uh -huh. Okay. It's Thank you. separate still. Yeah, right? it is separate it, it's still separate. Yes. It hasn't been rolled in anywhere but, yet. But it will become part of fund balance. Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Then the other piece? The, the other piece, if there's money available, and it is an if, I mean, it is that we have some contingent liability, you know, contingent liability, it's not quite the right term, but we have some ongoing liability there. Um, and um, if, and that, we, the, there's a year timeline on that as well. So I guess that is totally, uh, that, number, that date coincides exactly with the, the date um, that we have to make this other decision on. So we will know, I guess, at, at, at approximately the time we are making this decision, we probably could get some flexibility from sure's on this. Um, I think that is considered utility money and uh, and is something that can be considered, if it exists, it can be considered as part of this universe. Thank you. So in response to your question, I'm with you or FERS. I think that's a no-brainer. We have to do it. I think we should just do that. Um, the contingency for Memorial, certainly, but I um, I don't feel like there's urgency there. I think we need to know that we're going to set some money aside, whether it comes from that, where it comes from. I, I, I think we will be setting some money aside, but I, I don't, I feel like, yes, I recognize that need also. Okay, so thank you. Councilor Paul. Thank you. Um, I don't think that, I don't recall us ever having a conversation that did not include the Money for burrs and the money for memorial. Right. So I, I, it would it would definitely be a change in course in what we had always discussed that those are costs associated with Burlington Telecom and therefore should be part of the settlement. Okay. 
Right. I was hoping we could get an estimate on the um, <coughs> amount of funds that may be drawn down to satisfy liabilities. We, is that something we can do now? None we can't yet, get anywhere right? near that. Yeah, we, the none yet I, is what I can tell oh, you. We're, we're not aware of any. What would be an example of a is a closing is it a closing cost or we no no uh, most, most of those would satisfy the yeah closing I, costs I mean there's some ongoing legal and and accounting and whatnot I imagine but um, this is the indem this is the yeah. oh for the indemnity oh, we're talking about the escrow account yeah, no escrow. that no there's been no claim made against the escrow at all and, and basically it would be let's say that they discovered that we had made a misrepresentation about. Uh, or something. A, a lien that was existed that we hadn't disclosed or something and that had to get satisfied, for example. Um, so we missed something in due diligence. Per perhaps. Potentially. That that would be an example. It might be that there's a uh, chemical waste dump or <laughs> somewhere. That's the right. more... So unforeseen services. Un unfor <laughs> those it's a, it's really an unforeseen <laughs> item, though. It's not, right. It's not so we, that's we why... We misrepresented or we miss... We, we, Poorly we estimated our something. cash flow. We need more cash. It's not that. No. <laughs> okay. No, it's an escrow account. It is in lieu of normally when a when a sale of a business closes like this, you would have an indemnification agreement by the by the seller would indemnify the buyer for things that they can do. The city doesn't do indemnification because to put the taxpayers on the hook for a wide open something would be like establishing a debt and we'd have to have a voter voter approval to do that so in lieu of that we agreed they agreed to take a million dollars set aside for a period of, of a year that was part of what we negotiated in lieu of an indemnification agreement that would be usual in most closings okay. so we won't know March. right mr mayor yeah just quickly it just occurs to me that um we have some new members of the council since uh since the last time we talked about bt who may not know ralphie and o'rourke who's our outside council that has worked on the uh, on the bt issues for the last several years i just want so how far do we need to go with this in lieu of the fact that we later the fact that we are taking you said taking no action tonight except for the plows which will be funded in some other way that we're going to hear about later. Since we do have another executive session, two others, one of which is going to take up a substantial amount of time. How far? I'd like to do one more thing, at least, before you break, which is that Ralphine brought a list, um, and, and particularly the new members, but probably all of you, of what we have already negotiated in the APA. She did a little, a good chart, I think, for you of the terms of if we were to take a carried interest in BT, what have we already negotiated? And and as soon as she hands it out, maybe she can run through just the highlights. This is a public document. And, and this is a public document. Yeah, there's nothing in here that isn't already in the asset purchase agreement, which is public as well. So, um, oh, so. If you can just very quickly yeah. run through the highlights. So really what I did is I went through the asset purchase agreement and um, kind of listed out the things so you could read it in more shorthand so you could find what you need to know. And essentially it's showing you that we had a retained a right to buy membership interests in Champlain Broadband LLC, which is the operating company of BT Telecom. Um, so what we have is the ability to buy a 7.5 percent that would be the minimum amount that actually triggers the rights that are sort of interesting to us like being on the um, board of managers which is the equivalent of like a board of directors for a corporation it's just called the board of managers when you're talking about a limited liability company so that costs approximately 2.4 million to to acquire that 7.5 percent we had also negotiated for the right to buy up to 33%. That was the maximum amount that they had allowed us to um, acquire. Um, to do that, though, that exceeds the proceed amount that we have available. So to do that, there'd have to be some other alternate funding mechanism, which we don't know what that is. Um, and then so the board is set for the LLC at seven, seven people. So it would be one of seven if we do the 7.5%. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that it, it, there's not an automatic right to dividends. It's only if the Board of Managers declares some sort of dividend structure. So um, 
while you would be able to get those dividends if, if they're declared, it's not guaranteed that they would be declared at any time. The company might choose to roll, in other words, its profits back into the company and keep reinvesting in the company. Um, however, the big thing that we did get was the right to, if we did invest, that we could have our investment redeemed. So in other words, if we wanted to get out of the situation, we have the ability to trigger um, a redemption. And we have set in there that that, would, you could get it, that could be done on an, an, on an annual basis. And I don't think it was negotiated how much you could do at a time. I think it was understood if you did that, it would be fully, you know, you'd be trying to get out fully. Uh, that was, um, the price for that was, um, it would be determined what the price is on evaluation of the company, but the multiplier, it was a six times EBITDA a, a multiplier, that was built into it. So that's fairly established. Um, and then the other big provision that's in here that's, um, you know, a, a good negotiation, I guess, um, is that if the if Shores were to transfer its interest in Champlain Broadband or were to sell the assets of Champlain Broadband, they would first have to go through a competitive bidding process and give the city the opportunity to repurchase BT. Um, and that actually occurs whether or not, just to be clear, that, that, that right is in there whether or not you have a carried interest. So I, I put that in here just so you under just to refresh your recollection on some of the other rights. That that pr particular provision is not um, contingent upon having an equity interest. Um, and then we hadn't actually negotiated yet and drag along and tag along rights, which are sometimes provisions that are put in when you're a minority shareholder in a company. Um, I, I reference that because those probably would end up being in a membership interest agreement. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to list, the last one, the last provision in this chart, is just all the other covenant provisions. They're sort of titled by the name of the covenant in the APA. There were protections that we built in for the city or for the customers um, that are still there. And those are also not contingent on care, having, maintaining a carried interest. They're just provisions that we're going to want to make sure we're monitoring and keeping track of um, because they were protections that were important to the city at the time. So I just wanted to reference those again. Um, so I think that's the sum. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to go over that. Mr. Hanson? Um, thank you. This is extremely helpful. Um, could you explain a little bit more this six times multiple? I think I'm not understanding what that is. So, um, the, I think that's the methodology that was used in this, in this, for pricing out this, um, the valuation of the company. So EBITDA is a is a term that means earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Um, and what it is, it's a way of sort of breaking down to the net profit of the company, and then they're putting a multiplier on it. It's just a mechanism for establishing a value of the company, and it was the methodology that was used to establish the pricing for Burlington Telecom by Mr. Dorman and others when it was being marketed. Um, and so we wanted to build back in that baseline level of protection if we were to, if we were to invest, if we were to want to get bought back out. That doesn't mean the valuation would be the same. It means the methodology for establishing the price would be the same. Mm -hmm. So if we sold our stake, if we had if the value of the company percent and then we sold that, this is how we would be paid out based on this methodology. Right. The idea would be that you would have an independent appraiser calculate the value and then and break it down to get you an EBITDA number, and then we'd have a multiplier for that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this? I don't want to get totally bogged down on this because we don't have to act tonight on all So, Councilor Shannon? Um, this might be just something for, for a future time, but, uh, well, you might know off the top of your head, what was the EBITDA rate, or you might not? That we that was used to calculate the value, which is a good comparison for what we're for the getting. purchase price that we established with yeah. Shores. Yeah. I believe it was the six times EBITDA. Oh, it was a six. Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, could you give us uh, some information about the governance structure? Because there's two. There's the Shores 
board and then there's the BT board and I remember having discussions that mm -hmm. different decisions are being made at different levels and mm -hmm. it's unclear to me what having what decisions are going to be before the BT board versus what decisions are really coming from SHERS. So the way that the structure of these entities, um, Champlain Broadband LLC is a limited liability company that right now is a 100% wholly owned subsidiary of SHERS Communications. So that company though, the short Champlain Broadband is managing BT its board of directors presumably is largely comprised of people who are either on the board or who are employees of Shores. Um, so it's the decisions are being made at Champlain, but with the the decision the decision makers are from Shores. Yes, and will that board be be um, hiring and firing the uh, the manager? Or? Yes, that's what the board. That's what that board. And if we had a seat on that board, we would have a voice at that table. We wouldn't have a voice that would be a deciding voice, but we would have a voice in discussing the management. We Can we get any more information about the makeup of that of that board? I mean, we kind of assume that it's going to be folks from Shures, but I imagine there are seats. There are other seats because they won't. They may have interests in having others at the table as well. They may. I I don't I don't know that there's I don't know what the comp composition of the board is right now actually. I, I forgot. They did. They have told us, but we can we'll get them for you. Okay. Thanks. Councilor Bush. So, um, I I feel very strongly that I need more information mm -hmm. as uh, in order to make a determination. Um, I I had already talked to the mayor and met with the mayor and. And wanted to know, you know, where Shores was in their plan to go outside of Burlington. Um, I also felt that I would very much benefit as one member of the council from hearing from people who understand um, telecommunication and investing in it and rate of return and relative risk. I really need to understand all of that so that I can educate myself so that ultimately when when we come forward with some options that I feel like I'm making an informed decision about where I'd like to land on the decisions that are before us as far as reinvesting in, in, um, in the company. So I realize you're short of time, but I'm concerned that there are 11 other people who might have very different questions and no, how not, are we gonna do not, this? It's not that we're not trying to get the questions answered, it's that we're not acting on this tonight and there's plenty of time to get more answers. About well, I know, but, but we need to get information so that the I, next I meeting isn't, isn't gathering what what do we want so that we're not wasting our time always just, gathering I, information. Council Bush, I understand. We just yeah. don't need to get totally bogged down on this. We can submit questions to the administration other ways as well. Council Fine. That was going to be my question is if you would want feedback from us as to what information we're looking for a third party to give us, how do you want to get that information from us? If you could email it to me, that would be great. We've, we've started asking for some, so the sooner you can get us information, the sooner we can there you go. Okay. That's okay. find it out. Thanks, Councilor Mason. Can I just, to that point, I mean, uh, Delphine does this. So, you know, there's a standard list of materials that we would ask, uh, you know, on behalf of any client looking to make an investment decision, financial statements, articles, operating agreement, like I would hope that you guys together could come up with that standard list and then assemble that for distribution and then take if there are specific unique, you know, things that members of the council want in addition to the supplemental diligence list. I think that's a good path between now and when we next take this up rather than waiting till we meet again and then saying, well, what do we need then? Agree. Because so we don't, we haven't set an exact time as to when we're picking this up again. It's not necessarily the next meeting. Right. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Person Ray, I am. Um, in, uh, just in terms of how you're thinking about what we are trying to get done tonight, I do think there would be value into further, it doesn't have to be very long, but discussion of this item in the executive session uh, in that you know, we have started to develop thinking about how to uh, look at this opportunity um, and I think it would be helpful to us in terms of understanding what additional work and analysis is going to be done, need to be done in the months ahead to have, share some of that in executive session and, and see if we're on track with where the council is or not. Okay, so then we should be getting into that executive session. Um, 
and we have two other ex executive sessions. Can we deal with those all in one motion? I think at least we can deal with them all in a series of motions. I'll see if you all agree. I can I can put them together in a single motion if you agree. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So the three matters you have, uh, three matters involving the negotiation of contracts. The first one is this in terms of a contract with, um, um, with, with Champlain Broadband for uh, a carried interest in it. And what we would be discussing is your thoughts and thinking about how we would go about doing that negotiation were we to pursue it. Um, secondly, you have um, an, an, a potential settlement agreement with Burlington Country Club con concerning the water overbilling matter, and uh, DPW has a proposal for um, a settlement, what a settlement contract with them might look like. The third one is. Um, uh, underbilling, that. Underbilling, underbilling that. sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you. Um, the, third, the third one is with um, City Place Burlington developer. And uh, again, we have a contract, that, a development agreement with that entity, and, and this deals with that contract. So um, the first issue motion that you would make would be the premature disclosure of these contracts would result in a net, in a um, premature disclosure of those would put the city at a disadvantage in the negotiations with those entities. There will be no action taken come out. Is that there is no action expected on any of those uh, um, except for that sidewalk plow thing that's listed right. in the in the next, and we will we do you are going to need to separate who's invited to each of those separately because you have different city staff and professionals. So we'll do those for each, each one. one that we go into. Yes, Councilor Mason. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just want to first note for the record I'm recusing myself from the executive session relating to the DPW underbilling matter, but leaving uh, after making that for the record due to a uh, professional conflict of interest. Um, I will make the motion that uh, City Attorney Blackwood made, noting for which matter do you want to deal with first. For the DPW, we'll have uh, Director Spencer, Ms. Anderson. Assistant so, so the DPW sure. item, um, um, Director Spencer, Mr. Assistant Moore. Director Moyer, and um, um, yes. Jessica, I don't know your title. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, from Public Works. Um. Okay, um, and then for the ET, who will be obviously your president, president uh, outside council, yeah. anyone else? Is that it? I think that's it. Okay, and then the final, I'm sorry, city place, who is president for that? I, obviously you. The CAO, um, Jeffrey Glassberg, I believe, is coming. Jerry Farkas is coming for that. Um, uh, um, Luke McGowan as CEDO director, um, David White as um, the former CEDO director and planning director have been involved in these negotiations. The mayor's and the mayor's office in all of these. Lori, you have, yeah, okay. Okay, so motion. motion has been Very made. Specific findings. The findings seconded by Councilor Busher. All those in favor of the findings, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passed unanimously. Councilor Mason? Mason. Oh, actually, oh, oh, who voted no? Sorry, was this, this was on all three motions, correct? That's correct. Yes. Then I voted no. Okay. So, two no votes. Uh, everybody else voted yes. Councilor Jane, Councilor Shannon. So it's a 10, ten to 2. Um, <coughs> so, based on that specific finding, I would make a motion to go into the executive session. Councilor so Mason, who's going? Councilor Mason, has, to go into Mason has moved based on the findings that we go into executive session. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilor Busher. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Two no's, and that's Councilor uh, Tracy and Councilor Freeman. So 10 to 2 to go into executive session. All right, so clear the room. I'm going to read the meeting of the city council at 747. Whatever you want, please rise. Good evening, everybody, and we apologize for being up here late and keeping you waiting for a few minutes, but we're here now, and we will move right into the public forum. 
uh, which, as I said, we're about a little over 15 minutes late from our normal time. We did, Councillor Busher. Sorry, you missed it. Okay. We're going to take your allegiance. And, um, so, just remind everybody, we uh, want to hear the comments that you have to make for us on whatever issue you want to talk to us about. Uh, your comments should go through the council president, not directed at any other city councilor or the mayor. Uh, and there should be no, uh, we want to hear your passion on any issue, but please refrain from any kind of personal attacks or anything. Uh, so hopefully that laugh was in good spirit to what I'm saying. Uh, so we'll open up the public forum and the first speaker tonight will be James Lees to be followed by Stan Hill. Stan Hill. Good evening, Mr. Lees. Welcome. Good evening. So I'm going to read something from the one sentence from the Law of War Manual put out by the U.S. Department of Defense. Parties to a conflict must refrain from the misuse of civilians to shield their own military forces and weapons. And that's what the military says itself. For violating this fundamental principle of the laws of war, the basing of F-35 jets amidst thousands of airport passengers and city dwellers in South Burlington and Winooski, Burlington and Williston is illegal and a war crime. So contracts between Burlington and the Air Force are void because the basing of F-35 jets in a city is illegal. It matters not how much money the Air Force spent to upgrade the airport or how many jobs are supposedly at risk. When something is illegal, that makes the contracts to do that thing void. No honorable military officer will allow the use of civilians as human shields. That's part of the elementary training for our military forces, especially when they have the choice to base remote from a city, as five of the other choices were remote from the city, from any city. As owner of the airport, Burlington has both the right and the power to say no to the illegal basing at its city-owned airport. Exercising this power prevents its government officials from complicity with the war crime of human shielding. And it also saves thousands of children and adults from harm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lees. Stan Hill to be followed by Charlie Messing. Good evening, Mr. Hill, welcome. Thank you. Um, I live on the east side of Burlington. I'm speaking about the F-35s also. They came and visited us for a couple days and I heard them land and I heard them take off. They're very loud and it's going to be assaulting us every day. I know this city passed a resolution a few years ago and it's time to do it again, but I think, I think that um, after reading the Pentagon documents that I've seen, it's obvious that we will have nuclear weapons in and out of here because the Air Force moves them around. They don't stay in one place. Because these are nuclear delivery systems, we will become a nuclear target from the Russians. In the event of a nuclear war, Burlington will be a subject, Burlington Airport, but Burlington too will be subject to a first military strike. I also want to urge you, besides condemning these things, I think it's time to take some of the people that are complicitous and take their names off of things. So I would urge you to rename Leahy Way and the Leahy Echo Center, because Senator Leahy has been instrumental in bringing these death machines to our town. I think we need to send a message that we don't want them. I certainly don't want to hear them every day, and I would hope my city council would take that seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Charlie Messing is up next to be followed by Joanna Rankin. Mr. Messing, welcome. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Three minutes tonight. This is great. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my park hurts. But I'll get over it. Um, well, I, I make comments on the comment sections of the, uh, the stories about all the things that go on in the city. I make comments on the comment pages of seven days, and then other people make comments about the comments, and it can turn into a brawl. Ah, good evening. And um, it's pretty funny. I, now, I have a following now. Uh, not a following like a bunch of people who want to hear what I say and who like what I say. More like uh, Welcome when to the you're club. walking down the street and a bunch of people are following you, calling uh, things to you. And if one of them happens to have a rock, they might throw it. So I have a lot of followers online. Anyway, um, they can't understand why we have opinions that are not theirs. Uh, they call us the Coalition Against Everything. That's uh, the Coalition for a Livable City. I pointed out and they disliked that immediately. 20 people disliked it. So um, the Coalition Against Everything and uh, they they say we're obstructionists. I don't know where they got that idea. It's the trail mix. They're all eating the trail mix. Anyway, um, unfortunately, I did go down to the fireworks with my decibel meter. And I was disappointed in that the loudest fireworks, which were really loud, they were about 129 decibels, are still half as loud to a quarter as loud as the F-35 will be, or is, wherever it is. And uh, that's really loud. And that's for a minute instead of a second. And it's eight times a day. That's pretty darn loud. I have a feeling that people are not going to be able to stand it, so to speak. And uh, those who call it the sound of freedom, well, they won't be able to hear it for long because it makes you deaf. So um, I hope everything's going well otherwise. And I'm going to try and make sure my followers don't catch up with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Messing. Good timing. Joanna Rankin is up next to be followed by Doris Bettinger. Good evening, Ms. Rankin, welcome. Well, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I also heard the F-35s, and um, we are very used to the F-15s, or X-16s living off uh, East Avenue, and they're much louder, and moreover, they're louder in the low frequency range, which isn't even counted uh, in the decibel figures that the that the um, Air Force is putting out. The kind of vibrational roar is very different in the F-35, so I don't think people will be able to stand it. But I want to speak about another matter. The F-35 is a nuclear bomber. Um, the F-35 is de designed to carry nuclear weapons. The U.S. policy, per the Nuclear Posture Review, um, identifies the F-35 as the principal U.S. delivery vehicle for airborne nuclear weapons. So um, that's what pilots will be training for, and that's what the, um, the F-35s uh, have a, a principal um, um, uh, purpose for. Furthermore, the B-61 nuclear bombs that they will carry are much smaller than the other nuclear bombs in the U.S. arsenal. And in some people's view, these nuclear bombs are usable. They can be, to use the horrible phrase, dialed down to, to uh, explosive power, which is even a little less than the Hiroshima bombs. And so they are, 
weapons that in some people's views could be used without triggering a nuclear war. And that is extremely destabilizing in terms of the kinds of detent or uh, a balance of nuclear weapon forces that, that uh, we've had up to this point. Um, furthermore, we can have little confidence in any statements from the Vermont Air Guard that their planes won't carry nuclear weapons. That might even be policy in present, but it can turn on a dime if the Air Force gives a signal um, and um, and they um, become nuclear capable in Burlington. And a very persuasive bit of testimony at the Vermont Senate hearings was the testimony of Roger Barassa, who flew nuclear weapons from Burlington Airport uh, in the 1950s. So that bridge has been crossed. There must be storage facilities for nuclear weapons. It is something that, that has happened in the past according to his own testimony. So we need to protect ourselves if we don't want nuclear weapons in, in Burlington Airport, if we don't want a nuclear risk in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rankin. Doris Bettinger is up next to be followed by Mark Hughes. Good evening, Ms. Bettinger. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I have in my hand a copy of the resolution that was passed in the Vermont Senate, Senate not too long ago. And I'd just like to quote one line out of it. And this is um, our own Senator Bernie Sanders saying he strongly opposes the basing of nuclear weapons in Vermont. Just by saying we don't want them and our planes won't have them doesn't work because we don't decide. Once we get the F-35s here, it is not our decision whether they get nuclear weapons or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark Hughes is up next. Good evening, Mr. Hughes. Welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> I speak in support of the racial equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, resolution. <clears throat> this resolution uh, takes the unprecedented step of adding a standing committee uh, for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee to the Burlington City Council. The committee, in addition to overseeing the implementation of the equity strategic plan, is tasked with, quote, the exploration of the creation of a diversity, equity, and inclusion commission. Uh, finally, this resolution states that the city of Burlington shall create a, a senior full-time position uh, responsible for overseeing, managing, and advising other senior officials in the city's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And the position will report to the mayor and be a part of the city's leadership team and have citywide responsibilities and authority. The fact that this resolution uh, is sponsored by 11 of 12 of you <clears throat> reflects that this city council not only has the ability to work together, but it also reflects your shared values of fairness and justice. <clears throat> I'd like to give a shout out to the counselors, uh, Ding, uh, Roof, also uh, Pine and Mason uh, for being at the center of such important work. And the mayor's office and the office of the city attorney who worked tirelessly to cause the resolution to come to fruition tonight. The chief of staff never took her eyes off a single detail and while loaded down with her normal impossible job, she got it done. In addition to the hours of work With the administration, Justice for All brought upwards of 80 people together last week at a community discussion called What Equity Looks Like in Burlington. Notably, one of the most important recommendations on the equity in the administration group was the creation of a paid position. The city in city government 
and a task force to address the equity in Burlington. Our next meeting is scheduled for August the 13th, and I invite you all to uh, be a part of that. Uh, we've always accomplished more as a nation when we've worked together. Our finest moments of progress come when all of the voices are at the table, not just the ones that we agree with. We reach our collective full potential when we embrace those who are different, not fear them or try to control them. And our best ideas happen when folks that don't agree with one another have difficult but necessary discussions, not avoid them. Now, this is a proud moment for Burlington and a defining moment for the state of Vermont. I ask you, please, don't waive the reading of this pivotal resolution tonight. I ask that the 2019 Racial Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Resolution be read to, memor to memorialize this work and our commitment to dismantling systemic racism in Burlington, in Vermont, Thank you, and Mr. in this Hughes. nation, that we may all have justice once Thank you, Mr. and Hughes. for all. Thank you. Creo, Creo That, That is up next, to be followed by Judy Yarnell. Good evening. Welcome. So the issue which I want uh, the city to pay attention to, I have been observed and uh, ex sadly experienced for many years. I've been in Burlington for 14 years. So we want the city to address the issue, the safety of pregnant women. And by that, I mean creating a parking lot um, near the handicap lot for just pregnant women. Because the pregnant women run the risk of you know, falling when it is winter time, even when it is hot, and it's a risk for unborn baby. So we want the city to really pay attention on that issue and really create, you know, a parking lot specifically, you know, for pregnant women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judy Yarnell is up next, to be followed by Tom McDonald. Good evening, Ms. Yarnell, welcome. Welcome, good evening. Um, I too want to speak about the nuclear capability of the F-35. Need to pull in your microphone, Ms. Yarnell. Pull your microphone right up close to you so we can hear you. I too want to speak about the nuclear cap capability of the F-35s. I was present at the, at the State House to listen to the expert ter testimony that Joanna Rankin referred to. Nuclear weapons have been here in Burlington in the past. Nobody knew about it. The city council didn't know about it. The mayor didn't know about it. And very probably, the governor didn't know about it. Uh, the F-35s are designed to carry B-61-12 nuclear weapons. Uh, I think it's highly likely that those weapons will be here. Uh, will we know when they're here? We have no assurance whatsoever. It's Defense Department po um, policy not to inform citizens where, uh, where bombs are stored. Um, this is a particularly pernicious bomb because the, the B-6112, because it can be dialed up or down. It's not de designed to be a deterrent like other nuclear bombs. It's a tactical bomb designed to be used in combat. Uh, do we want to be part of that in any way, connected with that? I'd like to remind uh, you and our citizens here that Burlington is, the, is a member of the Mayors for Peace organization, which was started by the mayor of Hiroshima uh, many years ago when Bernie Sanders was mayor of Burlington. He happily signed on. Um, I urge us to think many times uh, before we approve the F-35s here. We have the power to do something about it. It's our airport. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yarnell. Tom McDonald is up next to be followed by Jennifer Decker. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Um, I want to talk about patrols and lack of enforcement. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was on Pearl Street toward the Battery Street end, um, and on the south 
side of the street on the sidewalk, three skateboarders got on. The first two went on. The third one fell on his back and rolled out into the street past the bike lane. And luckily for him, there was no car coming at that same time. Okay, not only is skateboarding an annoyance and maybe uh, uh, can cause possible injuries to p pedestrians, um, but obviously in this case, with, with the condition of, of Burlington sidewalks, they're not too good, and he could have been killed or, or maimed. Anyway, so I looked past him further west, and there was a person in a nice yellow jacket and I would have expected that person to say, hey, carry your skateboard. Didn't happen. Okay, this, is, this sort of thing is repeated on the Church Street Commons. Uh, so a woman smoking, she goes past, and there were the t two uh, female patrol officers there, and they're uh, referred to by some people as the two bumblebees. They're together, and I can't see why they're together, because it seems to me it's a job, and the enforcement doesn't, have, doesn't need two people together. They can start from one end and cross each other, and they can be aware of lots of stuff. If they need the big guns, they, they have a phone. Okay, I saw that woman smoking. I looked back uh, toward the uh, patrol officers. Nothing happened. There was a kid on a bike. He went through. <coughs> Nothing happened. Um, and then I saw uh, in one situation where there was a skateboarder who was also a smoker, <laughs> and he was going up Church Street. So that encapsulates the whole... Uh, business with the lack of pa pa uh, real patrolling and uh, that kind of lack, lack of enforcement after a while it, it creates a sort of seedy atmosphere you know you like to have some freedom and you don't want an armed camp but at the same time somebody should say hey you know put the cigarette out I've never seen that and I think we should thank you Mr. McDonald mm -hmm. Jennifer Decker is up next to be followed by Lucy Gluck. Good evening, Ms. Decker, welcome. Thank you very much. I came to speak out in opposition to the basing of the F-35 nuclear bomber at the Burlington Airport, which uh, the city council does have the power to cancel. And um, that's a really uh, important opportunity that all of you have before you. Um, I wanted to share some of the testimony um, by Dan Grazier. He spent 10 years as an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, he had deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan and felt that that taught him to evaluate weapons and equipment for their true military value. He also graduated um, in, uh, with a degree in military history from Norwich University. And um, he works now for the Project on Government Oversight. Um, he has studied the waste and abuse that, that often accompanies pe Pentagon weapons programs. Um, the F-35, uh, the current price tag, as far as I know, is something around $1.5 trillion. Um, surely much more costly to all of us as American citizens than is being factored into our local conversations. Um, Despite the uh, flood of optimistic press reports emanating from the Pentagon and industry-funded media outlets, the F-35 remains a deeply flawed program. Um, so other folks have spoken about the nuclear issues, um, and there are many other issues and problems with the plane. Um, but just to uh, highlight some of the, nu the nuclear issues, the, the B-6112 bomb which is sized for the F-35's bomb bay, um, is uh, the world's most dangerous nuclear weapon. Um, so I wanted to invite all of you on the city council and the mayor to an event that we're holding to commemorate Hiroshima and Nagasaki on Sunday, August 4th, from 4 to 6 p.m. in the park across from the airport. Um, where we'll be continuing to educate the public and educate um, our leaders about the importance of banning the basing of these planes. So 
Um, I wanted to also quickly mention that um, the planes are single seat fighters. Um, this is uh, the first time in history that um, on a nuclear platform we only have one person working together, I'm sorry, one person uh, launching the weapon. Previously on all other systems there have been multiple people involved. Um, the jobs are not what um, has been promised. Um, the jobs will mostly go back to Lockheed Martin, um, not to folks in Vermont. And the ownership cost to Vermont is very steep. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Other cities have said no. This is our chance. Thank you, Ms. Decker. Lucy Gluck is up next. We followed by Rachel Siegel. Good evening, Ms. Gluck. Welcome. So I think most folks know I live in the Old North End and I grew up in South Burlington just a little ways from the airport. So it's been here since I was really small, five years old. And the airport and that community, our community in Burlington and also Winooski especially, all the people that can't be here to speak because they may not speak English, they've only been here a little while, but they're the ones who are going to be heavily impacted by the F-35. I personally think there's just a, a long list of reasons why the F-35 should not be based in Burlington with the population that we have so close to the airport, the health and safety issues. But as a bottom line, when next month I'm hoping you'll actually consider a resolution that's being worked on by some of the folks on the city council here, um, when that language is presented to you and has been very similar resolutions have been passed to say we don't want nuclear bombers in Vermont. It's kind of a no-brainer. I think everybody can nod their heads and say, whether this thing carries nukes or not, it still makes us a target, unfortunately. Um, but to at least draw the line there, and, and so we're putting our hands in, in, in your, you know, your minds and your hearts to really do whatever research you can between now even and next month when the resolution comes. One place that has a lot of media, really unbiased reporting and a lot of good information is the Save Our Skies Vermont website. If you haven't ever been to that website and you can see all of the people that have um, given the reasons why the plane should be canceled. But there's a huge section of that around the nuclear issue. And so if you could just take some time, some of you have already done this, but if you have a few minutes to look at that before your meeting in August when this resolution comes before you, I would appreciate that. I think it would be helpful for the discussion. Um, and to know that we're following in, you know, Winooski, South Burlington, the Vermont State Senate has all said this makes sense. At the very least, we could um, make our voices heard around the nuclear issue, and, um, and I hope that you'll be willing to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Gluck. Rachel Siegel. Good evening, former Councillor Siegel. Welcome. Thank you Dave Hartnett's up next. Nice to see you all. Oh, good. One after the other. Um, I am here to speak to a couple of things. First, speaking in favor of the diversity, equity, and inclusion resolution that you have coming forward. I'm really excited. I was really excited when Councillor Dang were, reached out to me about it, that things are moving forward in this way. It's one of those things where you look back on the work you did several years ago and go, oh yeah, duh. Like, why didn't we do X, Y, and Z then? And now it's it seems so obvious now that he laid it out and that you've all worked collaboratively on it. It's really exciting. I'm really excited about it. And I have two little hesitations about it that I'll mention because I think there's always room to do better, right? One is my concern about having a singular position in charge of it. We know that when Dan Ballone was in that position for the schools, he died of a heart attack. That wearing the job of being the person doing diversity and inclusion work for a huge institution, especially as a person of color, who hopefully that's who you would hire because they're the experts on racism, that that's a huge toll um, in terms of the stress and can cause heart attacks and kill people. So maybe the next iteration is to give a department, not just a single person. And then I also hope that nobody just pats themselves on the back because we always all need to keep working on this stuff and especially for white people to continue our own development and racial identity work. So thank you in advance for doing that. I also unfortunately am here to speak in opposition to the F-35s, which we all know now are going to be nuclear capable. 
And we all know that while our senators have said they don't want any nukes here, they're not likely to, to I, I don't see them following up on their word on that. Um, but you can. And we can. And if you go to the Save Our Skies website, you'll see a list of seven different cities where, through resident pushback, the Air Force did, in fact, change their mind. It is, in fact, not too late. It is not too late. And you are in a position of incredible power. So I hope you will utilize that. And, and it brings us back to diversity and equity, because if you are really true to the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you'll recognize the disproportionate impact of the F-35s, even if we do make it to the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a year, we're heading up on the 74th, even if we make it another year, and we don't get bombed for being a target, we still are disproportionately impacting poorer people and more people of color with the noise impact. So if you really stand by the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, as you're doing with this wonderful resolution, I hope you will also apply that to the impact of the planes on the poor people and people of color. We know that militarism always impacts poor people and people of color more than people who can be insulated from it on the Hill. Thanks. Thank you, former Councilor Siegel, former city councilor, Dave Hartnett. <laughs> councilor Hartnett, welcome. Good to see everybody. It's glad to see, I'm glad to see uh, Councillor Siegel here because my topic is commissions and the selection process and Councillor Siegel and I made great changes to that, hopefully for the better, but obviously we failed. Just not two, three Monday nights ago, but over the last six years, this process has, has been a circus here in the city and it's been unfortunate. Probably one of the most important things that we can ask from the public is public, public engagement that we want people involved. And serving on commissions is, is, is one of those roles. Why would anybody want to serve on a commission knowing the process that we've been through? What happened to Commissioner Dunn a few weeks back was a disgrace. A man that has given great service to the city many years representing the Progressive Party is up for reappointment in the police commission it's not the fact that he didn't get reappointed. I know those things happen. It's the fact that this council used him as a bargaining chip to get their friends on the commission and get political favors done for them at the expense of Jim Dunn. How did Jim Dunn not get appointed when everybody up here on this table wanted him to back on the commission? I'll tell you how it happened. We put our friends on and we take care of our political flavors, and we're worried about who might run against us for city council, okay? And it's not all the councilors. It just takes one or two to ruin the process. And quite honestly, there's a long history here, led by Councilor Paul, that plays games with this process, that is committed to putting her friends on and doing political flavors. Keep it, I, try to keep the names out. I, I didn't, I'm, I'm directing my comments to the council. But I'm just going to call it as it is. You can't have that process. You cannot. You worked five and a half hours putting a slate together the Thursday prior to that on the 20th. Right? What good is a slate when all these side deals are being made, putting their political friends on and taking care of their friends? What does that say to the people that want to be on our commissions? So I come with a solution tonight that I hope this council will think about, because I know it's easy to come up here and complain, right? But this is what I'd like. I'd like the process to look like three city councilors representing different parties, the chair and the vice chair of each commission that we're selecting, and a representative from the mayor's office. That committee to put the council to the uh, commissions together. That takes the politics out of it. That takes the friendships out of it. We're also getting input from the chair and the vice chair of what that commission might need that they might be looking for. We'll hear about attendance issues with commissioners, right? We don't go, excuse me, I want to finish up because there's one point I want to make. Because we do have an issue with one commission on the police commission with attendance records. She's been approached about whether she says continue to serve or not. She was approached before the process. She has made it very clear she wants to finish her term. She is feeling bullied by city councilors to leave that position so they can get Jim Dunn back on the commission. That is unfortunate.
that we have a single mom who's got a mom in a nursing home that she's trying to take care of, and she feels that members of this council, and they're the same ones that are play all the games, are bullying her to get off that commission. That is not okay. Thank you, Councilor Hartnett. Karen Long is up next to be followed by our final speaker, Nancy Jacobson. Good evening, Ms. Long. Welcome. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Give me a minute, please, because I am going to read tonight instead of like losing my thought, because I tend to. I get nervous. So I'm going to talk about the lake and our sidewalks. I do want to say, um, before I read my piece, that I heard the most troubling thing, that somebody went to Burlington Health and Rehab, and the only thing this person wanted was to get outside and get some fresh air. And I have recently complained about one of our step-ups from the sidewalk is the size of my phone. This is one slab, this is the other. So this woman, who is 70, had to push her friend, who I don't know how old she is, on the street. And we know on East Avenue, same thing, co-housing people say that our sidewalks are so bad on East Avenue that they are push, you know, in their wheelchairs, motorized wheelchairs on the street. So anyway, that just, I can't believe you can ignore that. And I do appreciate the extra $500,000, but that is not going to um, help when we're spending $6 million on City Hall Park. And those sidewalks are good. So anyway, I'm sorry because I actually have something written here that I want to read to you. Um, Stormwater runoff is the greatest source of the excess phosphorus fueling algae blooms and accelerated eutrophication. The city of Burlington loves the rain garden, and I do too, but it has been incredibly lax and irresponsible about enforcing our regulations on lot coverage, letting lawns be lawns instead of parking lots, and protecting public and private green space from compaction and vigilante paving would do yeoman's work in reducing stormwater runoff. This simple measure, following the lot coverage rules, would keep phosphorus and other nutrients and pollutants out of the lake and substantially reduce the beach closures from both algae blooms and E. coli. This is a crisis that the city has shamefully ignored. All around town is housing required by law to have green and permeable yards front and back but landlords have seized this space for parking to benefit themselves, despite the damage of our lake and our neighborhoods. What has the city done? Next to nothing. In many cases, it has helped landlords break the law and pollute the lake. This needs to change. The sorry state of our lake, even Trump's EPA has noted it, is matched by the sorry state of our sidewalks, I already said that about the sidewalk, so I'll leave that out. I am really upset that you're going to tear up sound sidewalk for City Hall Park and spend $6 million when our sidewalks are so bad. Anyway, as leaders, you are obligated to step up and step up for the lake and step up for safe sidewalks, will you? And I will tell you, my first complaint was in 1997 when a parking lot was put in the backyard on Luma Street. And now you can, and nothing much was done, but you can walk on Luma Street and there are so many yards that are parking lots. Not officially paved, some are, some aren't, but I have been crying about this since 1997. And now with the lake closures, I'm hoping, or beach closures, I'm hoping you will do something. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Long. Our final speaker tonight, Nancy Jacobson. Good evening, Ms. Jacobson. Welcome. I just didn't want to use my cane. I realize, of course, some of you people are familiar with me and some, maybe some of my past with this city. but I want to tell you about me. I started in college before I finished high school. 
I was raised in Madison, Wisconsin, and born in Milwaukee. I came to the city, and it saved my life. I was supposed to die before I was 30. My husband and I are great-great-grandparents, and we've raised four children in this town. Our eldest is currently uh, in Washington, D.C., at, at a committee. She's retired Air Force Space Command, worked on the projects in outer space, and was space, stationed at times at the Pentagon. My background is I speak four languages, and I've lived overseas for several years. When I lived overseas, especially in Paris, in the 16th arrondissement, which is, is the embassy area, I attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Wisconsin, Trinity, excuse me, Trinity College, the University de la Sorbonne in Paris, and the University of Vermont. I'm an alum of those colleges. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Housing and Design, Housing and Environment. I wanted to be an architect when I was young, like my well-known grandfather in the Midwest, especially in Wisconsin, Minnesota. And my family been in politics for years. And what I'm here today about is an issue that should never happen again. My, I have contributed this to, to this committee for years and been elected official in several positions, including specter of elections, worked by chair for many years, and I am fed up with what is happening, and I agree with the people that I just heard. Now, my grandson was visiting us. He and his father, who's been in prison twice, is no longer allowed on our properties. And the is issue that happened happened on this morning that I'm going to tell you about. And I hope you will listen to me and not cut me off. Take another half a minute. Our grandson was told earlier in the evening that he was to leave our property with what he could carry and come back the next day and get what he needed, and he was no longer allowed on his property, nor was his father, who was twice imprisoned. He's now out east, and he's already got himself almost killed. But he made a phone call. And the person who came to the door while I was putting away some knives in the kitchen because of our grandson and my husband horsing around, putting his hands over me while I'm holding knives in my hand, stabbed himself. I go to the door and I still had a small paring knife in my hand. Forgot all about it. And apparently I was yelled at three, three or four times, my husband says, drop that. Well, I didn't drop it because I knew if I did, it would spring up, knowing what I had in my hand, and injure somebody else besides myself or the police officer or my husband, for God's sakes, in my front entrance hall. And the next thing I knew, I got rid of it. I threw it out to the east. I was facing south. He was facing north. Ms. Jacobson, I am going to have to. And he assaulted me. He slammed through the door three steps after I took, and he slammed me on the floor just before my heart surgery. And I've been handicapped since. And this is my first time out since this happened. And I will not put up with it. And if something isn't done by a person who lies or is not trained properly, something else is going to happen here. And one person on this committee knows about it, and I leave it at that. Thank you, Ms. Jacobson. J.F. Carter Newsbizer, final speaker. Good evening. Welcome. 
Good evening, and yeah, sorry to, to sneak in at the last minute there, um, but I just want to express my support for the resolution that Mark uh, helped introduce and, and that I think will most likely pass unanimously um, tonight, and it's, it's definitely a step forward, and the Special Committee on Policing is a step forward, but I just want to make sure that uh, the council and our community make sure, uh, similar to what, to what uh, Rachel Siegel had mentioned that we don't kind of lull ourselves into a, a false sense of security around we did it now we can put that issue to bed and move on um, because you know it's it's a constant process and I certainly am not one to pretend that I grew up in a family that social justice was a, a common topic around the dinner table um, but it, it takes a lot of work on an interpersonal level and and on an institutional level, and, and I think everyone on this council representing the community of Burlington um, has kind of a, an extra responsibility to be um, investing in that. And, and just to highlight the need to continue that work, um, you know, we had conversations around body cams, we had conversations around, um, you know, the need to divert resources um, into addressing the root causes of, of why we need policing in the first place, why uh, folks are suffering from addiction and poverty and uh, and trying to decrease those interactions, negative interactions with police. Um, and still we had an uproar um, in, in city government and, and among the community that was somehow anti-cop to have those conversations. So I think, you know, while this is probably the most significant um, piece, like resolutions that, uh, at least in my uh, short four years of being involved, um, we need to make sure that we recognize that there is a ton of work to do uh, moving forward. Um, and then quickly, because I am running out of time, I just wanted to uh, express my support for the resolution that should be in front of everyone in August opposing the basing of the F-35. Um, and I also just want to throw on folks' minds that we should really start to have a conversation about um, ranked choice voting again in the city and, and the benefits of it and uh, how that can benefit our local democracy, both in local, state, and and federal levels. So I appreciate the time and uh, thanks for letting us speak. Thank you, Mr. Neubizer. That will close out tonight's public forum. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight and speaking. We appreciate your sentiment. Uh, and we will now move on to item number six, which is the consent agenda. Councillor Busher. Yes, I'll move to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Second. Second by Councillor Roof. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda and taking the actions indicated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Item number seven on the deliberative agenda is a report from the Burlington Electric Commission. A report from the Burlington Electric Commission. Did they hear you? <laughs> no, I don't think they did. I think you're coming out. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, for the council, I am Gabrielle Stebbins. I'm chair of the Burlington Electric Commission, one of five commissioners. It's great to see you all this evening. And with me, uh, in case you guys have any really sticky questions, is our great general manager, uh, Darren Springer, who just started up on his second year with us. Um, I trust you received both the annual commission report, which was this time signed by all of our uh, commissioners, um, as well as the performance measures report uh, covering all of our efforts and the BED team's work over the last year. Um, also, I, I don't know if you have a copy of this, but you should take a look at some point. It's available on the website, um, the 2019-2020 strategic direction. And I just want to highlight, I, I work in the energy field, not so much in Vermont, but um, in many, many states in the U.S. as well as Canada. And the, the major drivers for an electric utility are to make sure that it's safe make sure that it's reliable, uh, make sure that the rates are affordable, uh, and then um, more and more over the last several decades, we've seen more and more discussion about making sure that um, the utility and the utility of the future is becoming more and more sustainable. Uh, and I just want to say that that is exactly what BED has been working on. Um, if you've had a chance to skim through the performance measures report, pretty much all of our stats are either improving um, or holding steady. And this 
goes from you know, how frequently um, there's a power outage, planned or unplanned, as well as how long the duration is, uh, as well as our rates heading into the 11th year of not having a rate increase. That's pretty unheard of when everything else you possibly buy goes up. Um, and also in terms of uh, reliability, uh, and finally the innovation aspect. The innovation aspect is really about trying to figure out how we can continue to drive towards the Burlington uh, City net zero energy goal um, by 2030. And that's for everything from power, so electricity to thermal, how we heat and cool our buildings, um, to also ground transportation, not airplanes. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, our four commissioners have been with us. Uh, we just had a new commissioner join last year, um, but otherwise everyone's going into another round. Um, and Darren, I don't know if you want to add anything. I, I just want to say that the team continues to work really, really hard. Uh, our, our budget that was just passed by the commission, you all, and the finance committee, um, if you take a look at those stats, you know, pretty much everything is holding steady. Uh, even, even, you know, labor expenses, every single way that is possible. Uh, this department is holding steady. Uh, and it, it says a lot, not just for a city department, um, but also if you look across the U.S. at uh, independent operated, so for-profit utilities, if you look at municipal utilities, and if you look at cooperatives, um, it's, it's really great work. Can we always improve? Without a doubt. Um, there's always room for improvement, but it is, it is great work, and uh, I encourage you to actually take a look and, and skim through that. I know you guys always have tons of materials, but it's pretty, pretty impressive, and it's why they keep winning lots and lots of awards. Um, I'll just add very briefly that uh, Burlington Electric's really fortunate to have the commission that we have and the support uh, that we've had from our electric commission has been outstanding in terms of helping us move uh, aggressively on a number of our goals. Uh, giving us appropriate oversight when it comes to our budget process and, uh, you know, really coming up with uh, ideas with us as we go. And I think that the uh, team really appreciates the interactions that we have with the commission. Uh, I very much appreciate Gabrielle's leadership uh, and we're, we're fortunate to have the dedicated uh, citizen commission that we have. All right, thank you. Questions, we'll start with Councillor Tracy. Thank you so much for this report and as well for your service to the city of Burlington as both chair of the commission and as a commissioner in general, really appreciate that. Um, one of the issues that um, I care about a lot is district energy and seeing that project move forward. And I'm just wondering um, what um, work the commission has been doing on that issue and how you see that work proceeding in the coming year. Sure. So we. We saw a lot of progress uh, over the last two or three years. We found an entity um, that could provide a variety of different business models, um, either you know, the city potentially owning and managing the project or them owning and managing the project and us being off takers essentially. Um, a lot of great research. Uh, at this point, I, I don't know if you guys are looking at natural gas prices uh, unless you work in the field, probably not, but that's what tends to drive the price of electricity right now. And it continues to be really, phenomenally low, um, which has, um, you know, made the discussion and the budgetary review um, for some of our key potential off-takers who we need, those linchpin properties, um, to really crunch their numbers tighter and tighter. We do have a couple of opportunities we're looking at moving forward. Um, I've been working on a side, couple of side discussions with uh, Darren um, in terms of how the Department of Energy might be able to actually help support the project. That's very far off in the future, but we're working on it. Um, and there are some new ideas about how we might be able to continue moving along this path. Um, the model still stands that if we were to move along what Corix, the, the company that had done a, a robust amount of work up until about a year and a half ago, a year ago or so, uh, the model still stands that if we were to shift over to the technolo technological design that they had come up with, that we would see overall a two-thirds reduction uh, in um, MMBT, so basically thermal carbon output um, is, is an easier layperson to put it. But do you want to add anything? Or? Yeah, I think um, we had uh, been focused in the legislative session on getting some authority to help us fund the next phase of work uh, through our existing incentive funds. Uh, we received that authority uh, in a bill that the governor signed uh, just in June, I believe. 
And so we're in the process of trying to reopen some of the discussions with the potential customers with that in mind and talk with Corex, talk with different stakeholders and see what the best route is to move things forward. I think the factors that uh, Gabrielle mentioned are very much uh, real. I mean, we are facing, we're essentially trying to move forward a competing uh, fuel source to compete with natural gas potentially at very low current prices. So we need a longer term uh, level of thinking, I think, when we look at this project. Uh, but it's very much alive. We have some new authority that we're looking to use to help move it forward. And uh, my hope is over the next coming couple of months, uh, we'll be doing some additional intensive work and have some things to report back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Councillor Mason. Thank you, President Wright. Um, thank you both for being here. I, I know in the report you touched on sort of the electric uh, lawnmower and the electric vehicle. I'm just hoping maybe you could speak briefly to that. And also, uh, I know there's sort of what outreach you're doing to sort of expand the scope. Of, I know that's been some criticism we've read in terms of its limited outreach. So I'm wondering sort of what you're doing to increase those wonderful programs that you're offering. Sure, I'll, I'll take a first stab, and Darren, you can, uh, you know, finish up after. Um, I'll just note that this is the general manager's, that the lawnmower is like his personal drive. I mean, <laughs> he's excited about it, like, every week to mow his lawn. Um, and I personally have signed up to try out the uh, electric vehicle that you can loan for, you know, a few days just to get a sense of how far you can drive on it, what happens when you go up a hill, down a hill, because um, I still drive, like, a 15-year-old Subaru. Um, um, in terms of uh, outreach uh, for the lawnmower perspective, um, certainly there were uh, a few different outreach events at our local hardware stores. Um, we have quite a few social media uh, events going on and going out. Um, actually, uh, one of our commissioners who joined us a couple of years ago, I think, um, Scott Moody, uh, just did a video of him trying out uh, the electric vehicle, and he says he's not quite there yet. Um, he needs to have a few more years to drive his current car in the road. Um, but you know, that highlights the need even more to your point of slow and steady um, and repeated marketing because we, we don't buy new cars every year. And if we're gonna make this transition to a more sustainable society and community, then we have to constantly, you know, gradually uh, infiltrate people's heads so that if they're going to, you know, maybe think about a new car in two years or five years or seven years, that they're ready there and then. But go ahead and add whatever else I'm missing. Yeah, I think with the lawnmower program, we've had great success. I think we've done more than 90 lawnmower rebates in a little over a month, and right. that's outstanding for us. We've had the uh, downtown hardware store and the hardware store on North Avenue, the 2A stores, sold out, I believe, of electric mowers for a period of time. And uh, I think what we're seeing is we have a $100 rebate on a piece of equipment that's three, dollars $400, and it's very comparable already to a gas mower. So people, the $100 is helping to move the market. Um, with EVs, we're offering, or plug-in hybrids, $1,200 or up to $1,800 for low-moderate income customers is still only a fraction of the upfront price. Even with the federal tax credit, we know the upfront price can be challenging. Um, I was at, and I'll, I'll leave it as an unnamed uh, auto dealer in the community uh, this morning, because we do uh, talk to our different potential partners in the, you know, the auto community. And I think we have a challenge when we think about outreach is that some auto dealers, even that have a plug-in hybrid or an EV for sale, don't necessarily look at it as a vehicle that they're trying to move actively. A few of them do. Uh, and I give them credit for that, but this is a market that's partly been created through a regulatory push at the national level, one that we fully support, and I think our challenge is getting more and more auto dealers, automakers to see this as something that the consumer wants and needs to have opportunity to test drive, to be educated about, because it's a unique experience when you get into an EV or a plug-in and you drive it and you enjoy it and you see the performance and fuel economy benefit, but we've got some outreach challenge there uh, with, with that particular aspect that we're working on. Well, and to that point, besides the fact that it's, it costs less to actually drive uh, in terms of, you know, filling up your tank um, with electricity versus, uh, you know, going to the gas station, um, the maintenance fees are significantly less as well. So there's a bit of a, you know, a push and pull there. If, if you're uh, an automotive dealer that actually does a lot of business by providing ongoing maintenance. So that's, that's a tug within the industry as well. Thank you, Councillor Mason, Councillor Busher, and then Councillor Pine. So you mean the advertising on TV for the LEAF is a little misleading, that I can't just fly? <laughs> That'd be um, great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so anyways, um, I am very interested in 
um, since my life has changed somewhat um, and I'm not really driving long distances anymore, I am more interested in an electric vehicle now. Um, so um, I, you know, I just wanted to just share that. Um, as far as the lawnmower, um, are there still electric lawnmowers now available? Yes. And how long will the rebate be available for people? We're, we tend to run our programs on a year-to-year -year basis, so most of the time we'll say that they uh, expire December, uh, the end of December, and then we'll renew or update them. Uh, but folks can expect that that program will be available for the remainder of the year. Uh, my intention is that we'll keep it available in coming years because I think uh, we've seen the value of that in driving adoption of electric mowers. And uh, I know it can be, it can seem a kind of a trivial thing, but it's it's really interesting to me that something like five to eight percent of local air pollution in a in a community can come from these types of engines, these smaller, non-pollution controlled, or very you know, relatively uh, non-pollution controlled engines. And uh, the statistic that really jumped out at me was that collectively as a nation, uh, when we spill gas filling up our mowers, uh, we, we lose more than an Exxon Valdez spill worth of uh, petroleum every year by spilling gas uh, collectively. So electric has a number of benefits, cheaper, cleaner, safer, and uh, I think we'd like to see this be a part of the future for a long time. That's Thanks. really good to know, and um, I'm interested, but I wanted to make sure that the people watching would understand how long they had in order to take advantage of this rebate. Um, you, um, Councilor Tracy asked you about uh, district energy, and in your communication you said, and you referenced this, that, um, that you were looking for some minor modifications to state legislation, and you said it was passed. That has to do with access to thermal incentive funds. Is that the piece of legislation that was just signed in June? Yes, yes, okay. the governor signed that bill, and it, it lets us use our existing funds to help support the project in a more meaningful way. Okay, and I think I had one other thing. Um, Thank you, Elsa. Let me just look and see. Um, oh, God. Maybe not. Maybe that's really. Oh, I think, I no, think that no. was it. No. Sorry. Okay. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, uh, in your report, also, you talk about the strategic direction vision for Burlington, a net zero energy. And you talk about a report, a draft that was available in May, and then a final report in July. Is that? actually ready for prime time? That's not yet. It's still being worked on. Um, the consultants that uh, BED um, and the commission uh, decided upon, there were many, many uh, consultants that submitted proposals. Um, their goal date for completing their near final report in terms of their research is the end of July. Um, and the goal on our end, given that so many people are out of town, et cetera, in August, is to really um, do a proper release uh, in September in terms of what their findings are. Obviously, there's going to be a give and take in terms of, you know, where does the discussion uh, take us? Um, but in terms of their uh, methodological analyses and all their modeling, um, that, would, that would be complete by then. Will, will that report be at least uh, either presented um, to the council or at least be on consent for us to, we were, to um, have access? We were hoping to work with the council to set up a date, hopefully in September, uh, where I could have the uh, folks from Synapse, which helped us with the study, and RSG come and present uh, with the Burlington Electric team and really do a, a thorough kind of run through of, of that analysis. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. A lot of items left to deal with. Councillor Pine up next, then Councillor Hansen, then Councillor Jang. Councillor Pine. All set. Councillor Pine passes. Councillor Hansen, then Councillor Jang. Thanks so much to both of you for being here and, and answering our questions. Uh, just two quick ones. Um, one is around the EVs. You mentioned some of the challenges around getting stronger up, uptake of EVs. Um, and this is a question that we had discussed a bit in the budget sessions, but I'd love if you could reiterate some of the potential solutions to get especially more um, low income up, uptake of, the, of electric vehicles. And, uh, and my other question, I'll just put it out there right now as well to keep it quick. Um, something I hadn't seen, but that caught my eye in the report was this um, energy coaching pilot program. I'd love to hear what's going on with that. Thanks. 
So I'll just say, uh, we should caveat, it's not that we're not seeing EVs not being picked up. We are seeing EVs pick, being picked up, but just in terms of, if you look at our climate change goals uh, and, and the desire from a lot of Burlington residents to become more sustainable, um, there's a lot more room to go there. Uh, and I'll just add, I know there have been a couple of efforts and, and um, there are a few uh, negotiated agreements with some of our local credit unions in terms of providing um, financing uh, terms that are, are more favorable and more helpful for low income uh, residents. And I, I believe we've had two mm -hmm. that are completed, yeah. um, but feel free to add more. I mean, when I think about the, the EV market penetration that we've had in Burlington with our rebate program. We have something like 85 rebates overall. Uh, I think three of those have been for low moderate income customers. Uh, the 85 is not enough uh, because we know we need really significant adoption of EVs. The three is not enough because uh, we're obviously not able to do enough yet to get more folks in. So one of the most significant things I think we could do, and we're looking at it, and we're not only looking at it at Burlington Electric, but I think all the utilities are working with the state on this is there is a new state incentive program that uh, is part of legislation that was signed this session uh, that may offer incentives uh, for, for folks uh, who are at or below, I think, uh, some sort of a median income level uh, to help them with EV purchases and leases, and that would be on top of our incentives. So that could be a meaningful opportunity to uh, add some additional cash and help make a lease or a purchase payment more affordable. And then in terms of our own incentives, we've not to date offered incentives on used vehicles, uh, which we know uh, with EVs, uh, used vehicles can still have a meaningful warranty on the battery. Right. And uh, you know, usually a car comes with about an eight year battery warranty. So if a vehicle is a coming out of a three year lease and has five years left, uh, that could be a good vehicle uh, for somebody to drive. We haven't had used vehicle incentives yet, uh, but the state is working with the utilities on that and there's potential for that uh, to make those vehicles more affordable and uh, we would have a role to play in helping customers with that. Um, and just briefly on the energy coaching that you mentioned, uh, Brian Riley, who's one of our great team on the energy services side, uh, working on energy efficiency, has been hosting sessions at the family room uh, and working with customers. And the idea is to go uh, where folks are who might need our help and might have questions about a high energy bill or an energy efficiency program. Uh, we've gotten great feedback from that. I think we're looking at maybe trying to expand that around the city uh, to other locations. Uh, Brian and our energy services team do a great job on outreach and, and that's a good example of them uh, thinking creatively in, in terms of getting out there. Thank you, Councilor Hansen. Uh, two more councillors, then I think we're going to conclude. Councillor Jang, then Councillor Polino. So thank you so much for being here. And I have a couple of comments and also a couple of questions. And first of all, Gabriela, thank you so much for, I can feel the love of what you're doing. <laughs> I, I can feel it, though, and also the kind knowledge, of a geek. <laughs> the expertise, all of that, I can feel it. Thank you for what you do for the city. Um, so my first question is actually in the second bullet. Avoiding the need for a rate increase for the 11th consecutive year. I see myself as still someone who is learning English. But my understanding here is that you guys have the need to increase the rates, but you are avoiding it. Is that accurate? Uh, not quite. Um, and Darren, feel free to weigh in afterwards. Right now, we're monitoring the need. Um, I mean, it's like, it's like a home budget. Um, you develop your home budget, you get a sense of your expenses and what your incomes are. Um, and if something different occurs, you have more medical bills or whatnot, you need to adjust accordingly. Um, we have uh, been watching and monitoring the regional market, um, and that's how a lot of our energy pricing um, and our uh, income, not so much our expenses, but a bit, but mostly our income, how that's developed is what's going on regionally. Um, so when regional shifts occur, um, we need to monitor and, and address what we might need to change in, in the event that those regional shifts end up creating more and more expense for us. Thus far, um, we've seen shifts, for example, uh, the value of renewable energy credits. We've seen some of those numbers go down and then um, back up over the next two or three years. That's one of the items that we've really been looking at quite a bit. Um, and because of other creative ways, for example, our McNeil um, uh, plant folks are very, very uh, 
both fair but also diligent in terms of getting um, a really reasonable price uh, uh, amount for our wood products. Um, so things like that. How can we reduce costs here um, to address when the regional market might change and therefore our income might change? Um, but, you know, things do change in the region, and we did think about a year and a half ago that we would probably need to increase rates in large part because of some of the regional market pressures um, and because of uh, a, a variety of different measures that the BED team um, have identified and then brought to the commission and discussed over a series of meetings, um, that the team has really figured out a way to keep, um, you know, holding off on that. Uh, will it come someday? Certainly, everything goes up in price someday. Um, but to the extent that we can hold our rates as affordable as possible, that's, that's pretty critical. Um, and to the extent that if and when we do increase rates at some point in the future, um, the, the goal there would not be to do it by a teeny tiny percent that we have to come back next year, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I personally would prefer to see a reasonable stepped approach that is thoughtful. And um, to the point about the rates, that's exactly what the BED team is doing. Okay. Um, I have other questions, but let me just ask you this one, because I know uh, many people are waiting. But, and it's not only BED, and I think it's, uh, th this, is, this applies to all city departments. Most of the time when we get these reports, we don't hear the perspective from the staff. Do you do staff survey? What are their satisfaction in staying in, in, in the company? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes, definitely. Um, uh, so two general managers ago, we had a very long tenure. Um, and then when we had a new general manager, um, uh, Neil come in. Um, he did a lot of probing, um, a lot of custom, not customer, a lot of uh, staff surveys, um, and that has continued. Um, and also, uh, to this strategic direction, um, to be honest, um, it kind of gets my goat, but this comes to me after the staff have had a chance at editing it. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> but um, the staff look at it first, and they say, uh, like one of the major changes that has occurred in the last year is, um, I think it's our reliability team, um, felt that they, when they looked at this, they didn't see their work. They did not see how they're showing up and making sure everything, all the, for folks that aren't that interested, perhaps the poles and wires, all of that, that it wasn't really reflective here. Um, and so that's one of the pieces that uh, they came to Darren about and they said, look, we, we need to see more of how this resonates in our day-to-day -day work. So um, yes, there are yearly, I believe, um, I know I saw one about a year and a half ago, uh, staff surveys. There's also been over the last three, four or five years um, significantly more workforce training uh, and a lot more um, you know, ongoing education opportunities as well. But feel free to weigh in on both. Yeah, we've had a um, employee staff survey in 2015, 2017, and we're in the process of conducting one for 2019. And at least for the 2017 and the 2019, I believe this was true for 2015 as well, uh, we don't conduct the survey. We contract uh, to have uh, a firm who comes in and conducts the survey for us and is able to kind of anonymize the data. Uh, so we get the feedback. We, we get to know what items are on people's minds, what things they would like to see more of, what issues they see. But people are, are taking the survey at a fairly high rate. I think last time it was around 92% participation uh, because they, they know that it's valued and they also know that they're not singled out uh, when they respond. And so we're in the process of setting that up for 2019 as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jane. Our final question from Councillor Polino. I'll be brief, but um, I just wanted to publicly thank you for um, being so welcoming to me. Every time I've had a question, you've reached out and we've met. And I agree with Councillor Jang that the approach you guys take to the work you do is, is very contagious. Um, and the fact that you've had zero complaints out of 21,000 customers in 2018 speaks volumes and um, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Polino. And with that, Thank you very much for that presentation. We appreciate that very much. And item 7.02 is a communication from thank you. Darren. Thank you. Appreciate your service. Communication from Darren, and thank you for the good work you're all doing. Um, Darren Springer, General Manager, and Chris Burns, Director of Energy Services regarding the resolution relating to energy efficiency in rental housing for a relatively brief update on this.
Thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank the council for the opportunity to present briefly on this report, uh, which was in response to the resolution from two months ago from Councillor Hansen. Uh, Chris Burns and his team helped put uh, some of the data in here together. Um, I think I can, I can summarize briefly, and, and Chris is here to help me answer questions. Um, what we looked at here was providing some background on the, uh, what we call the time of sale ordinance, but it's the minimum uh, you know, rental housing efficiency standards ordinance. Um, looking at the background there, looking at data uh, that we have and that we've worked with Vermont Gas on to accumulate uh, for the report uh, that really looks at, at trying to give a whole picture of energy efficiency in the rental housing space. Uh, BED is only a partner in that space. Uh, Vermont Gas uh, is a significant partner for us because uh, roughly 95% of the community is served with natural gas. Uh, they run energy efficiency programs for weatherization just like we do on the electric efficiency side. Uh, so if it's a building that is uh, electric heat, oil, or propane, uh, we would be the energy efficiency provider on the thermal side for that building. But in most cases, uh, when it's a natural gas building, Vermont Gas is doing uh, the bulk of the work as reflected here. Um, and they've been very helpful, I think, in helping us put the data together. Um, some of which in here is, is fairly uh, unique data that looks at these different uh, pieces by ward so that each area of the city can be looked at uh, in terms of energy use. And um, I'll, I'll probably leave it there and see if uh, there are questions that Chris or I can answer uh, related to the report. All right, great, thank you. Questions from the City Council? Councilor Hansen. Thanks so much. And just to give a little context for, for folks watching, um, the, the main issue that we're trying to address here is kind of the idea of this, the split incentive where we are a renter heavy city, about 60% renters, but um, and most of those renters pay the heating bills but aren't able to do any efficiency work and the landlords are able to do it but often don't because they don't pay the heating bills. So that's an issue and, and we've, because of that, you know, we've had somewhat limited uptake or, you know, people aren't taking advantage of a lot of these great incentive programs that are out there for, for energy efficiency. So it's, it's both a climate issue that we, we need to solve and um, also an affordability issue as well. So that's kind of the background of, of why we're pursuing this. Um, and in terms of some of the questions I had um, around the report, so there was one statistic in there that said that um, potentially about 40% of eligible units for, for this type of efficiency work have had some work done. Um, I was wondering what time frame that was over, that that work had been done. I'm going to say in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Um, and then the a couple of the other items that could, I, I wasn't totally clear on the, in terms of the averages, so we got a snapshot of average usage um, per square foot. Could you, just to give us a sense, could you tell us how that compares to the national average? And also, I wasn't quite sure from the data how that has changed over time. Um, cannot tell you how it compares to the national average. I mean, it's, it's driven by the age of the housing stock, local and state energy codes, programs that have been running for years, climate. Um, there's just so much that goes, goes into it. So what we gave you was real data um, through our partnership with Vermont Gas, through our Energy Champ program. Um, looking, uh, working with the city assessors, getting square footage for the buildings um, and doing those calculations. Um, but I think you'd have to go and find reasonably like uh, age, type, and most important climate, heating and cooling degree days. And in terms of the, how, the progress we've made over time, do we have data? We have this current snapshot, and I was a little unclear on how it's changed over time. We haven't gone back and done that same analysis year after year, so I can't answer that question. And I, I should add some context is 
we run the energy efficiency program through the state. It's a state regulated uh, program as an energy efficiency utility uh, and we're unique doing that in Burlington. The rest of the state has efficiency Vermont on the electric side and Vermont gas runs it on the heating side. Uh, so we pretty rigorously track and report and there's some links in here, the data for our expenditures through that program. Um, but some of the data that was requested here, we either don't typically track or we had to partner with Vermont Gas to access the data. So where there's gaps, that's the reason why. And, and I understand there's, there's been a lot of ongoing discussion about solutions and, and way to, ways to move forward um, on this issue and understand there was some hesitancy to make recommendations. Um, ahead of some processes being completed around that, but I'm wondering if you could at least provide um, some of the potential ideas. Um, I think there are some kind of no-brainers and would love to kind of move forward as quickly as possible and curious to hear um, if you could speak to any of the potential ways to make improvements. Yes, yeah, so as mentioned in the report, we've had a group, uh, not just BED, but really a city group that's looked at these issues around this specific ordinance over the last year and is continuing to do that work. I think through the Mayor's Housing Summit we have consideration of not just this particular potential reform but other meaningful reforms that could go as well. I think our, our feeling is, is that it would be premature to recommend changes based on this particular ordinance without knowing kind of the outcome of some of that additional work because uh, it could have an impact on what type of uh, investment we're looking to make, what types of requirements we're putting in place, uh, you know, what effectiveness we would have. But I can say that uh, the types of issues we've been looking at are, you know, is the, is the cap on cost uh, still appropriate or should it be uh, reconsidered in light of, you know, today's energy efficiency investments, uh, likewise with the payback period requirement in the ordinance. Um, as well as uh, we've had conversations around the enforcement and how that can be administered. So I think we would like the opportunity to complete the work uh, through the housing summit uh, process and be able to offer recommendations not just related to the uh, time of sale ordinance but to the broader suite of potential programs that could positively impact energy efficiency for rental housing. Great, great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say as a comment, first of all, thanks, thanks for all your work and Really excited uh, to work together and moving forward. I think there's a lot of clear solutions that we can move forward on together. Um, I think a couple things that just stood out to me as, as pretty glaring that were kind of identified uh, in this report is, and for those who haven't read it, you know, this was an ordinance from 1997 and we haven't had, it was made clear that there hasn't been strong enforcement of the ordinance and there also hasn't been tracking of our performance, how many, you know, in terms of compliance with the ordinance and in the impacts that the ordinance is having on our goals. So I think um, these are some key things that we can really work together that I see as, as kind of no-brainers um, moving forward to strengthen this and, and also build upon this policy to really um, weatherize every, every home, every residence and in, in apartment in Burlington. Thank, Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Thank you. Thank you, oh. Councillor Freeman. Else else Nobody else had their hand up, so oh. you're up next. Sorry, I almost missed my No, you're good. Go. Um, thank you for this report. Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on um, Councillor Hansen's question. I you know, appreciate there's a ton of information in this report. Um, I did feel that the recommendation, um, you know, it was a bit... It, confusing, I think, because it was so vague. Um, it's, it's just four sentences. Um, it, it's an answer, but it feels a bit like a non-answer. And so I think for me, um, this issue in these, these, and I feel from your, from your department and from your leadership that there is a similar uh, sense of um, desire to really address the climate crisis and to really work towards efficiency. Um, I have an incredible feeling of urgency around this issue. Um, there's not a day that I don't think about the fact that there's what an 11 year clock ticking to solve this issue. Um, so for me, this, this four sen the sentence recommendation um, felt incredibly vague. Um, I'm really looking to the administration and to your department to understand um, a better idea of this timeline. There wasn't really um, any elaboration on when the housing summit um, 
when that feedback would come back um, and how we can really move forward um, because we don't really have time. Um, it, you know, not to be, it's not dramatic to say that we are in the midst of a climate emergency, that this is a, clim this is a crisis. Um, and I, I really want to bring that sense of urgency. I, this, this, um, this was you know, un unanimously supported by the council. So I was just looking, I, there's so much information here and I, and I so much appreciate that work, but I was looking for just a lot more sort of information, even some low hanging fruit in terms of um, some, real, some real recommendations that we can get going. Thank you, Councilor Freeman. Mr. Mayor, did, did you want to respond or Mr. Mayor, are you? I, I would just respond to the question about uh, the follow-up from the Housing Summit. You know, as we committed to at the summit, um, we expect to have, uh, we have committed to a September 4th meeting, um, uh, public meeting where we will be um, offering preliminary proposals on uh, all five of the issue areas that we took on that day, had workshops on, on it that day, and um, I have already uh, responded to Councillor Hansen inquiries to try to collaborate uh, in the lead up to that, and uh, we welcome the opportunity to try to do that as well. So um, uh, we are agree, um, and you know, have been working for years uh, on this. Uh, Net Zero Roadmap, which will also be released in September. Um, I think uh, we are on the cusp of uh, detailing how we are going to achieve probably the most ambitious municipal energy goals of any um, uh, municipality in the, in the country. And uh, uh, we share your sense of um, urgency and, and considerable more details forthcoming on that timeline. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We all set? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Director Burns and General Manager Springer for that update. We appreciate it. Item number 7.03 is a presentation from Kather Hashim and Ahmed Latif, BHS students. And we've got about 10 minutes for you to give us a presentation on this, on this uh, issue. Good in evening. In support ladies. of children of Yemen. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ahmed Latif. I um, uh, came to uh, Vermont from Iraq as a migrant on uh, 2013. I had BA in law and uh, practice law in Iraq, and I had BA in English language. And I just graduated from Vermont Law School. I got my master in, my master in law, and I planning to have um, uh, exam for bar, Vermont bar examination. Um, I'm here to, just to support my daughter. Uh, she leading uh, initiative to support a Yemeni crisis, a Yemeni children, and I will let her talk. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kather Hashim. Um, I came here from Iraq in 2013 with my family as an immigrant. Um, I am a BHS high school student, rising junior. And my dream job is to be a cardiologist, and I want to serve my lovely community. So today I will be talking about the crisis of Yemeni children. Um, next. Um, the violence of this war have caused thousands of victims to die to, and um, to be injured. Um, and most of them are suffering from lack of severe um, food, drinkable water, medicine, and um, safe shelters. And the Yemeni children has been affected by the war the most. Next. Um, so right now we'll be moving on to um, quick facts. Quick fact number one: every ten, I'm um, sorry, their population is 29.2 um, million. Um, 75 of the population is in need of humanitarian aid. People in Yemen um, uh, do not find food to feed them or their kids. About 5 million, which is approximately 17 percent of the population, is in. Um, living in family-like condition. Um, two million are displaced, and under that goes A, about 2.3 million people have been either um, had to leave their homes, which is unfortunately still happening. Um, Yemen is the largest food emergency in the world, and um, there are about seven million kids in Yemen. Next. So um, we'll be mo moving on to important facts. Important fact number one, every 10 minutes, um, a child under the age of five dies because of starvation. Next. Um, so as you can see in this picture, um, um, 
the, um, sorry, children in Yemen, they really need food and they really need medicine. And I think the, the picture can really speak itself. Next. Um, so in here, this is a video um, that was published by BBC News. Um, it's a reporter from BBC News that went to Yemen and met a female doctor there. And um, in there, they, um, the doctor kind of just showed her um, around the villages and why they really need you know, um, help there, and especially the children. So you can play the video. Not around the video. You can play the video. <laughs> You can just click on it, maybe. Play the video. He's trying. Oh, right. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in volume now. Can't hear the words. Um, there's a sound to it. I need the volume. <laughs> That's if they don't know that. Did that already. So the original video was five minutes, but we had to cut it down um, due to the limited time. This is, yeah. Um, so you can press next. So 8.4 million people are at risk of famine, and not to mention 14 million people um, don't have access to clean water. So um, as you can see in those pictures, um, the, the water is really bad. Um, and can you just imagine your kids have to go through that and, um, and you're not able to you know, help them, you're away from them and you would appreciate everyone or each one that trying to help them. Yeah, next. So the people of Yemen are facing random attacks, bombing, snipers, kidnapping, rape and more. And um, in these pictures, you can see that a lot of people are dying, and all of them are be losing beloved ones, and especially the ones who are leaving behind children, especially young ones. Next. 
Um, about a quarter of school age kids are, are, are out of school, and 2,500 schools have been either damaged or not able to run. And um, the, the children's basic rights is just to have education, and they can't even have that in Yemen, so it's kind of bad. Next. Um, 14 million of Yemenis um, don't have access to clean water, as I said, um, and 1 million people in Yemen are suffering from cholera. And so, uh, yeah, it's okay. Um, so this is um, a speech by Bernie Sanders that he did at the beginning of this year, and he was the first one to speak about this issue, and he rose awareness from, like, to a lot of people, and I was actually one of them. I didn't know about um, the issue that was going on in Yemen, so that really helped me. And um, so the video is too long, so I can't really play it right now. It's like 14 minutes, but this is the link um, in below. You can check it out, I guess. Um, so I'll just be reading like two bullet points. Um, I kind of just summarize what's going on in the video. So um, at the end of 2019, it will have taken the lives of 2019, sorry, 219,000 um, Yemenis and 140,000 kids under the age of five because of starvation. Yemen is at risk of famine and the most severe famine in more than 100 years. Next. Um, so what do they need? I put this um, in two groups. The first group is short terms and then the other one is um, long term. For short term, term, sorry, they need drinkable water, food, safe shelters, and medicine. For long terms, in general, they need protection. But f if we kind of divide that in half, they need um, safe camps. Both, dis both dispute parties should not be bombing or using these camps and it should be running under the UN. And um, the second one, it, should, um, it says safe baths, and just, this is just to help the Yemeni kids who are trying to, who have um, problem with their health care. They can just go to other countries' hospitals, and um, it's basically kind of just temporary health access in other countries. Yeah. That's, um, so um, I made a donation link in Mercy Corps. Um, so if you want to donate, you can just go there and um, you can donate. And your donation will reduce all the pain for, from those um, redu sorry, powerful, innocent, and poor children. And this is the link. Um, we're trying to also make um, a GoFundMe account, but there are some technical problems with it. So we will send you the link afterwards. Next. Um, so most, this is my cited page. Um, most of my information I got it from the UN um, website. And Mercy Corps, yeah, next. Next. Um, I want to thank all of the mis Mr. Counselors um, and Mr. Counselors um, for being here and giving me this opportunity. And a special thank to Ali Cheng for um, making me come up here. And um, I want to thank all the people, the audience who have been listening. Um, and I want to thank everyone who made me come here. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much for that really moving presentation. And um, hopefully the video tonight will help you raise some more money to help more kids in Yemeni. Uh, Councillor Pine? Could I ask a question? Yes. <clears throat> Can you just tell us how this, this is a tragedy, this is an incredible disaster for this entire planet, but how did it, how did it come up for you as the thing that you wanted to focus on? Well, um, the whole story started um, when my one night my dad he we usually talk about political not political public topics, and so um, he said that he talked about the um, the Bernie Sanders speech, and so I heard that every ten minutes a child dies, and like I didn't know about that, especially I'm Arabic, I'm Muslim, and like you know I kind of should have like at least have an idea about it, but I didn't know about that, and so um, it's a it's a heartbroken story, you know. And so um, after that, I did my research, I went to my teacher, and then this is basically where I started. Thank you, thanks yeah. so much. Councillor Jang. Yep, and it sounds like you from Iraq. Yeah. And Iraq been in war as well. Yeah. So why not help Iraqi children? And why focusing on Yemeni's children? Um, well, it's our moral duties to help, um, as a human being, to help the whole world. Um, especially the whole world is like a small village. So we need to help all the people. Thank you. Yeah. 
And you know, just a 15 years old BHS student, I think um, this is inspiring. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And Abdul Latif, thank you too. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Anyone else? Thank you very much for that really moving presentation of the heartbreaking pictures that we will all remember and hopefully we can all do something to help that situation out. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Uh, tough to move on after that. Item number 7.05 and 7.0. So, note we're missing 7. Point, got it. 7.04 is a special, I told you it was hard to move on. Special event outdoor entertainment permit application, uh, Councillor Roof. Thank you, President Wright. Uh, I will move 7.04, approval of a special, of special event, uh, outdoor entertainment permit application. Application is for July 19th, 2019 and July 26th, 2019. Mr. French Band on July 19th from five till nine. Amplified Music, yes. Dancing, yes. Phil Aviar Band on July 26th from five till nine. Also Amplified Music, yes. And Dancing, yes. Seconded by Councillor Tracy. Um, anybody need to comment on this? Other than to say the Phil A. Bear Band. <laughs> no, we'll talk. We're all set? Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Item number 7.05 and 7.06 have been removed. And so item number 7.07 .07 is a resolution, racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. Councillor Jang. Thank you, President. I wanted to make a motion to introduce the resolution 7.7, uh, waive the reading and ask the floor for a second. Seconded by Councillor Pine. Councillor Jang, you have the floor back. Yep. Um, I think it's important to bring some background around this resolution as it all started with uh, Mark Huge, and then he brought up to a couple of city councils and we worked on uh, making it better. And we were fortunate for this time around to have the privilege to work with the mayor, Weinberger. And today we had a wonderful, um, great conversation at CCTV Channel 17, and I really recommend that when the video is up for the council to look into it, um, because everything started with the vision um, and of the of the mayor, who, when he came to office in 2012, directed Vermont a Partnership for Healthy Community, I believe, you know, to create the the strategic plan. And then the, that report came back, and since then, you know, the, the council and also the mayor have been busy with all the things. And I'm glad that this is time around, we all came back together. And very impressed of every single person here, um, especially those who met with the mayor, um, Roof, uh, Pine, uh, Mr. Mason, as well as um, uh, the mayor's chief of staff, Jordan Rebel. But I think it's important that because Burlington uh, prides itself on being a welcoming and inclusive community, as the largest and one of the most diverse city in the state of Vermont, we have the opportunity to be leaders in highlighting the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just through words, but also through meaningful action. And I think this resolution is an important step in this direction it creates a senior position in the city government to guide and support city leaders and departments in becoming more diverse, equitable, inclusive, internally, and all across around what we do. So it also creates a committee of the city council focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that committee will be tasked to explore the creation of a commission um, so I think those two components are very, very important because around this work, nobody has a crystal ball. We're all trying to figure it out. And I think 
having someone who would monitor progress and who also will be reporting to the, the mayor directly as well as the council as we move forward. So it's no doubt that the city, in the city, we have, we face many challenges, but we have learned that diversity in our community is one of our greatest strength. We cannot take this diversity for granted. We must work diligently to ensure that everyone, regardless of race, religion, gender, identity, age, ability, or country of origin is fully included in the fabric of our community. And I think uh, Latif, who was just right here, 15 years old from Iraq, who just inspired all of us to look at the world in a very global and uh, aspect. So we all live now in the same boat. We all live, we all human beings, basically. And I think this resolution began to develop the focus through the creation of a new position, which has ne never been um, created in my knowledge. There were components of some um, city staff to do that work, but now someone will be here to work diligently to erase race-based disparities around um, city departments and also to make sure that inclusion is at the lens of everything that we do. So to finalize, I want to thank Mr. Mayo again for his leadership around this issue. We also cannot thank enough Stephanie Seguino, who is here, who worked diligently around this resolution in giving us the accurate data that we all need. Rachel Siegel was also here and to talk about uh, what we need to do moving this forward. And I think one aspect of it um, is maybe down the road for us to think about the creation of a equity and also engagement uh, office. So it won't be just the work of one person. And what is good about this resolution also is there are so many steps in order for us to get to where we need to go. One of the steps is to just vote it tonight. And um, after we vote it tonight, the mayor will be working also with a couple of city councils to create that job description of that person. Um, and then from there, the council will be able to weigh on that job description, make amendments, make it better, and then hopefully to hire that person by January 1st. I think that's important um, to highlight. Um, so, and I'm sure there will be some uh, amendments because there are not a city council here that haven't weighed on this resolution specifically. And I think Sharon Busher, we had a lengthy conversation about this that was also very inspiring. So we hope that um, everyone will be able to vote for it and so that we can move forward as a council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jane. Councillor Busher. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to um, just to echo um, what I learned about the process and how inclusive it was. And I really appreciate Councillor Jane reaching out to me and the conversation that we had about um, how he wanted to move the plan from the shelf to become uh, active and to be fully embraced. And I think this really does that. Um, I had talked to him about one minor amendment, which I'm going to make or put forward. Um, but um, the rest of this is I see that, you know, uh, I was going to call her counselor. Siegel, but Rachel Siegel came forward and, and she did reference one concern. She was hoping that by having this one position, it wouldn't diminish the effort from the existing team. And I certainly want to make sure that that doesn't happen because I see this person as helping that team still have that commitment um, to um, racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. But I see that this individual will help keep them focused and have keep this as a priority. And so I see this as, as essential working collectively with the existing team and not eliminating that team. So um, I certainly um, want to um, just make sure that 
um, her fears aren't realized. Um, this is in no way diminishing, this is augmenting and expanding um, our commitment to this. Um, the one uh, amendment has to do with line four, where um, I have to smile because I, um, it has to do with it, talking about diversity as a gift, and this diversity encompasses people of color, people with disabilities, older people, that's where I want to make the change, LGBTQ, people of different faiths, etc. So the people working on this, I believe, were in the younger category. And so what I had hoped to do was to eliminate the older people and put, and not really eliminate the older people, but, <laughs> but to replace that language with people of all ages, because I think that's more consistent with what we're talking about. We are trying to reach out to people everywhere, and it's not just older people, but it's people of all ages. Um, and so I'm going to move um, that or um, as a, an amendment to this resolution. Thank you, Councilor Bush. This is where I really wish we had friendly amendments. Me we too. could just accept this. But since we don't, is there a second to the amendment? Second by Councilor Jang. Any discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, all those in favor of that change in language that Councilor Busher just suggested, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank so, you, Councilor Busher. You have the floor back. Thank you. Um, I had also talked about making some other changes because, as you know, the resolution um, states over and over people of color. And when I came to lines 20 through 23, where now it was, um, it stated blacks as opposed to people of color, I thought about replacing that language. But I also remembered about the report that came to us from the criminal justice system, which did differentiate blacks from Asians, et cetera. And so I chose not to change that, the blacks to people of color, because I felt I was tinkering with a report that did differentiate different ethnicities, and I didn't feel uh, this would be well-founded. So I've left that alone. And um, so Great. having said that, um, I'm really happy to be one of the sponsors and be, and be voting in support of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Pine, and then the mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to point out that um, in, in many respects, our school district has taken the lead on this issue, really. They have had devoted staff. They have a committee, standing committee of the school board that is perhaps called the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee, I think. And um, I just want to point that out and say that I think we have a lot of work to do, but it's really important that we not shy away from a topic that makes folks sometimes uncomfortable. And I think that's really important to just be upfront about that, name it, and, uh, and focus on the result that we're trying to get. I do think that um, I want to respond to Mark Hughes, who asked me specifically, because he was pretty sure no one else would want to read it. I'm going to read just the resolve clause, if I could. So, um, Mr. President, I know we waived the reading, but I'm going to take a minute to do that. Now, th now, therefore, be it resolved that Rule 4 of the Rules and Regulations of the City Council shall be amended to add a Standing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee to oversee the implementation of the City's Equity Strategic Plan as follows. Committee assignments, no later than the second meeting following the election of the President of the Council, that is, the President shall appoint standing committees on licenses, ordinances, institutions, human resources, charter changes, community development, and neighborhood revitalization, public safety, parking and transportation, energy and utilities, parks, arts and culture, and tax abatement, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Be it further resolved that in addition to overseeing the implementation of the Equity Strategic Plan, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee is tasked with the exploration of the creation of a Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Commission and shall report recommendations to the City Council within 90 days from the time the committee is established. And be it further resolved that the City of Burlington shall create a senior full-time position responsible for overseeing, managing, and advising other senior officials on the city's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. The position will report to the mayor, be part of the city's leadership team, and have citywide responsibilities and authority. 
and be for it further resolved that the City Council respectfully request that the administration, in consultation with the City Council Institutions Human Resources Committee, develop a job description and seek Council approval for the proposed position on or before September 23, 2019, and seek to fill the position on or before January 1, 2020. Thank you. I just wanted to get that into the record and make sure the, the viewing and listening public was aware of what the Council is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, President Wright. Um, <clears throat> I too want to thank uh, everyone involved in uh, working um, extremely collaboratively and uh, productively to bring this uh, action to the Council tonight. Um, particularly appreciate Councillor Jang's um, leadership on this and uh, collaborative posture throughout this and the generous recognition tonight that this is in some ways the continuation of work that we certainly have been trying to do as a city throughout the last seven years. Um, I appreciate your recognizing of my role in that, but I, I, I do think uh, it was it's fitting that Councillor Siegel is here as well tonight and that um, she definitely played a leadership role in, in the early formation of the committee. And I do think we have made some progress since the, the um, plan was completed in 20, um, for, uh, 2015, sorry, 2014, um, and uh, I think that plan focused us as an administration, as a city, on some areas that uh, may not have gotten as you know the attention without without that work. Um, I think, in particular, some of the work the police department has done. Um, reviewing why we lose applicants, people of color going through the police, trying to who are trying to become police officers, and, and why the outcomes are so much different for uh, recruits that are, are people of color than, than white recruits. Um, I think the work that has been done, um, being much better about out reaching out to various uh, communities, uh, particularly communities of color, um, to encourage people to apply for. Um, uh, our commissions, ha there's been a market change there. We have made, we have moved the ball a little bit in terms of overall uh, city hiring and diversifying our workforce um, I th and, 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 and more. Um, I do think this core team structure that was set up uh, intentionally instead of creating a, a position at the time on the recommendation of the report has had some effectiveness, but um, I, I'm very clear that I think this is the right step tonight, and the whole senior team within the administration is supportive of this. Um, I think we are at a moment, you know, it's just such a tumultuous, interesting, scary time in some ways uh, to be um, in this country, and there are so many uh, uh, concerning and unprecedentedly uh, terrible things, uh, shocking things that we see our federal government doing. Um, I also sense somehow simultaneously with that a, uh, a real reckoning in, in important areas including uh, racial justice. I think there is a uh, growing awareness of just the vastness of the um, you know, the magnitude and the, and the, rel and the recentness of uh, government injustice uh, to in particular African Americans. And I sense there is a moment we can, we can make, we can make, we are making progress as a country where there's urgency for that progress and Burlington, every institution in America needs to be part of that. Certainly the city of Burlington um, needs to be a part of that. And I, uh, the current structure um, puts too much, too much relies on work out of the mayor's office uh, to, uh, to move us forward and for the kind of sustained, steady day in, day out, detailed, rigorous work that I think really is necessary to make us an institution with less institutional bias, uh, less implicit bias. Um, we, we need the discipline and the rigor and the capacity of someone waking up every morning say, saying, how do we move, move the city forward today? I think that's what this resolution, this position is going to do, and uh, I'm excited that it appears uh, to have such broad support tonight. Thanks. Thanks, President Wright. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other comments by the council? Are we ready to vote? We're ready to vote. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number 7.08.
is commissions and boards, boards and commissions selection committee regarding the special committee on policing uh, appointments. Uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, President Wright. Uh, I would like to make a motion to approve the following slate of individuals to fill the seats on the special commission to review uh, policing practices. I would note before I start listing them off that pay attention because this is different than what was published um, with two additions and I'll highlight them. The first is two members representing local communities of color. The slate would include Mello Grant and C.D. Madison. Second is the member representing a local mental health substance abuse service provider, Dr. Kevin Rogers. Third is a member representing the local LGBTQ Q community, that's J.F. Carter Neubeiser. Next, the member from a local activist organization, Skylar Nash. Finally, a member with a professional, uh, a personal and professional background that would enrich the work of the committee, that's Jim Dunn. Um, let me go back. That's the slate, I will say that just for everyone's benefit, that was, I did have discussions with the members that were on the committee and that amendment to the slate was approved by all members of that committee. Second, my motion would be to re-advertise the position for a member representing a local domestic abuse service provider. And I would ask for the floor back after a second to explain. Second by Councilor Roof. Councilor Mason, you have the floor back. Thank you, President Wright. Um, first, I would like to thank the community for, again, your overwhelming interest uh, in this very important position. Um, our committee met last week to review the applications that were submitted um, prior to, just for the council and the public's benefit, prior to the meeting, we did have three individuals that sought to be removed, um, but we did still move forward in light of that. Um, the one that's re-advertised, um, we did not get any applicants that were interested in filling that specific role, so I would ask, you know, I know we've all agreed to sort of do some outreach to try and fill that position, and as soon as possible, I think the expectation is that commission should kick off and get started, because unfortunately, we don't meet again as a council for some period of time. Um, so with that, um, thank you. Well, and I also, I know the council president, there are some members of that are here that may wish to speak. Um, but I would again thank members of the public for their interest. Unfortunately, we did have, you know, more interested qualified applicants than we did necessarily slots. Um, but again, thank you for your interest in um, what I hope proves to be a productive exercise. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you for chairing that committee and good work to the committee. Um, a couple of councillors are lined up. First, I do want to see if anybody that applied wants to speak. You don't have to. The names are on the slate and are going to be approved, but anyone want to? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to Councillor Pine and then Councillor Polino. Mr. President, it's really just a question of how to ensure that this, this position that's being reopened, much like the position for, uh, I think we designated it as a provider mental health and substance abuse. This is a, a member representing local domestic abuse service provider could we also just understand, perhaps without any amendments, but that that could also be just a person with lived experience? Councilor Mason? I know, that, I know our resolution didn't say that. That's probably the... I, I'm not sure I'm the appropriate person to answer that question. I don't know if it's Roof or... I, I have a quick... Whoa, 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 whoa. Nope. You've got to be recognized. Don't get to speak um, without so recognition. I mean, the answer is I, I don't know. I mean, I know other than the belief was we would do specific outreaches to individuals that represent those organizations, but I would say our application of the criteria was somewhat loose. You know, okay. you didn't have, um, so yes, we would encourage anyone that's interested that may fit, but I also, I'd welcome, if Councilor Roof has a different view as the author of the resolution, I would defer to him. Councilor Roof. Councilor. <clears throat> uh, the language is the language, but I think the, the intention was not uh, to strictly limit it to be a, an employee of or a director of uh, a, a, any of these service providers. So if there's someone representing a service provider, maybe with the endorsement of, they could be someone with lived experience and not be an employee of. I think that would maybe meet, meet the intention um, if the whoever does the selection uh, deems it applicable. Uh, I think that was the intention during the authoring of the resolution. Uh, sounds like we all agree. Is that sufficient, Councilor Pine? Thank you. Councillor Polino? I just want to say I had an update on that and I uh, probably should have reached out earlier, but I did reach out today and got back from Keona Heath from the 
network against victims of, uh, she's a SANE and program coordinator of Vermont Council on Domestic Violence, and she's confident that if she's not interested in the position, she will find somebody to apply for it. She just wasn't ready to do it by 4.30 today. Right. Um, so it'll be, I'm confident they'll produce somebody and meet. Thank you for that update, Councilor Polino. Any other Councilor, are we ready to vote on the slate? Appears we are ready. All those in favor of the slate as proposed by Councilor Mason, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Seven point oh nine is a resolution for the use of proceeds from the sale of Burlington Telecom. Um, this originally was on here from the Board of Finance. It is not being sponsored by the Board of Finance, but it actually has my name on it. Councillor Paul, did you want to? Did you want to move it, Councillor Paul? I, I am prepared to, to do so if you want to. No, why don't you go ahead, Councillor Paul, if you don't mind. Sure. No, I don't mind at all. Um, so I'd like to move the resolution, waive the reading, um, ask the floor back for the floor back after a second um, as I need to make a few amendments. Seconded by Councillor Shannon. Councillor Paul, you have the floor back. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are where the I have a I have a copy of the changes um, is it possible to put those oh Councillor Paul you're Sorry. off the microphone yeah I know, I know. we're working on getting those up okay. there because so that so that everyone can follow along okay well they'll work on getting okay. them up and you just all right go so ahead. um on the Resolution before us, um, I would uh, propose the following amendments. To strike lines one through four uh, on line 19 to change the dollar amount from $1,075,000 to 570000 uh, dollars and on line 19 as well to replace the words uh, proceeds from the sale of Burlington Telecom to dollars from the unassigned fund balance. Um, and then as well on line 19, uh, to replace the word eight with the number four. Um, and, uh, go, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to just mention that, uh, uh, just for the benefit, especially from people who are following along, that um, I think this resolution um, is a, another example of collaboration between the administration, the council, and also the Board of Finance, who discussed this earlier. Um, I think all parties have worked collaboratively to address a significant capital need. We all know that we need snow plow, uh, snow, uh, sidewalk plows, yes. Sidewalk plows, no, snow plows, sorry, <laughs> sidewalk plows. Well, we need both of them. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we need, this, this is a way of collaborating to address a significant capital need and balance that with a funding source that we all hopefully can support. Um, as, as, as we all know, the mayor and his state of the city address stress the need to replace our aging snowplow fleet. Um, the resolution asks for the council to support the purchase of four brand new snowplows, uh, sidewalk plows, um, and over time there will be a need to replace others, but um, that will be in the years to come. Um, the, uh, the resolution originally came from the Board of Finance, and because of the funding, there was some concern about that, but I believe that um, all members of the Board of Finance now support the resolution we have before us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Powell. And so, Councillor Powell, can you, I, I lost track for a second there. So, to crystallize the changes that the number of amendments made is, again, one more time, Okay, so the, to crystallize it, um, we are going to be taking, if approved, 570000 from um, dollars from the unassigned fund balance as opposed to where it was originally going to come from, which was double that amount, um, $1,075,000 that would have come from the proceeds of the sale of Burlington Telecom. So in other words, instead of eight plows, we're talking about four. Okay, and the other four will be decided at a future date. Yeah. All right, yes. thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Busher and then Councillor Mason. 
I guess point of order. Is there a motion on the floor? That's what I'm trying That's to figure your, out. Paul, did you make a motion on those amendments? So, was there a se oh. second? Did second you, you put that on the floor as amendments? No, I did not. And okay, I so will you are now. making that motion on those a series of amendments that did what you just suggested, yes. and it is seconded by Councilor Anyone. Councilor Busher. No, we're not going to go back and forth. Councilor Busher, you want to second that? Fine, fine. You're seconding it. Okay. But I want to speak to this. <laughs> <laughs> no pointing back and forth. <laughs> go ahead, Councilor Busher. You have the floor. In addition to the second. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just wanted to further amend be the title, so now it should be use of the unaf unassigned fund balance um, to purchase four sidewalk tractors, and that's, I just wanted to make sure that got updated also. But I did want to speak um, to uh, this amended resolution. Um, I, wanted, I want to thank the mayor for um, uh, listening and um, coming forward with a resolution that he can live with, but certainly felt more strongly with the original resolution, and I, and I understand that. Um, I had um, suggested that maybe we could use the unassigned fund balance to fund to do this, um, and actually it had a conversation once again, trying to revisit where we were with, you know, we want to have at least 10% um, 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 in as unassigned fund balance, and we're at 13.5. And so I had talked to the CFO about how much money that really was and was trying to come forward with a proposal that wouldn't fully fund all eight, but maybe would have funded maybe six or so. Um, uh, I know that um, there was some hesitation in, in moving forward with that dollar amount because of some uncertainty with where we're going to land and how we really wanted to preserve some of the unassigned fund balance in case um, we came up short and we needed to use some of those dollars. Um, so I am I'm happy that we are able to deal with the emergent issue of the sidewalk plows, and I'm also happy that we will continue the conversation about how, what we, how we are going to deal with the proceeds from the sale of Burlington Telecom. It is unfortunate that the timeline for the purchase of these plows was August 1st, and yet we had not had a opportunity really to have an in-depth conversation about how we would spend um, the proceeds from Burlington Telecom. So that's the unfortunate part of this um, um, process, but um, I'm happy to move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. And just to be clear, uh, you, when you talked about the changing of the title, I don't think we need uh, an amendment on that, right? We can just have the title changed to say that it's unassigned fund balance. We need a motion. Do we need an amendment on that? Yes. We need an amendment. Okay. okay Councillor Busher makes the amendment. Yes. Change the title. Seconded by Councillor Pine. Councillor Pine. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of changing the title, as suggested by Councillor Busher, to unassigned fund balance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Thank you. And we have Councillor Pine. I wanted to, s to echo what uh, Councillor Busher said regarding the, um, the mayor's willingness to hold off on the BT sale proceeds going to this particular priority, which we all think, I believe, everyone agrees, is, is a top priority, and we need to figure out how to improve our sidewalk plow fleet. Um, I would ask in the, in, the, in the next maybe few weeks or maybe a month or so that there be some analysis about the savings in terms of labor hours and parts and basically downtime, I mean, it's, there is a significant savings in having new equipment in the fleet that will free up people. And that, um, I know I keep harping on this idea that when we, when we have in the past need to buy fire trucks or police cars, lease purchasing is one way to do it. And you would use the revenue that would normally come into the department for capital expenses to service that lease p purchase payment. So I just, want, I just want to hammer that one a little bit more because I don't feel like I've said it enough. <laughs> Thanks. 
All right. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, President Wright. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm fine with tonight's outcome. I think it, it, uh, it's a good step. It, it's an important step in the right direction that it is supportive of our, of our team that um, works during the, the snowstorms and some pretty tough conditions in these vehicles. Um, and it's gonna, it will have the type of benefits that Councilor Pine um, was just alluding to, which are, you know, not, are, are significant. Um, and I do think this will minimize um, public frustration, will reduce some of the public frustration we've sometimes seen in storms when vehicles, these vehicles have been broken down and it has slowed our response to clearing the sidewalks. I, I do just want to note here, especially given that this is also note the night that we began to talk about um, the BT uh, funds and, and how they will be used that um, I think uh, the kind of challenge in figuring this out is a, um, uh, a harbinger or, you know, is I, I think showing, um, illustrating some of the challenges we're going to have in the next budget year if we want to maintain the, I think, considerable momentum we've built over this, this being the third construction season in a row, if we want a fourth construction season where we're creating the level, this sort of historic level of sidewalk replacement, sort of historic level of road repaving, um, continuing uh, to um, uh, move forward with uh, the upgrades of our fleet that was a, has been a major part of this facility, uh, of the sustainable infrastructure bond as well. We're coming to the end of those sustainable infrastructure bonds. We are projecting a modest gap for FY21 uh, to sustain this. And if we are not going to um, consider dipping, using BT funds for uh, capital items, I think we're gonna have a real challenge and, and that is part of why uh, we think it is not prudent to go beyond the, the four uh, vehicles here. Um, and so I just wanna note that we have you know, I'm confident we can get through it. I'm confident there's some good solutions, but we do have some challenges coming if we want to contain, continue through FY21, uh, this kind of level of investment. Um, and, uh, and, and then we will have further um, challenges in FY22 and beyond when the sustainable infrastructure funding is completely gone. So this is going to be a topic we return to in, in the months ahead, years ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Hansen. Thank you. Um, could someone provide some clarity just on the on the math here and how we ended up at the 570? That's a good point to remember. Rather than half. I'm sorry, Councilor Hanson, I missed. I, I'm wondering how we ended up on that number rather okay. than rather than having the C number. CAO Anderson. There was a discount to buying eight that we don't get if we buy fewer. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Hanson. Are we all set to vote on the amendment. We, st we haven't voted on the amendment yet. No, we haven't. No. Are we all set to vote on that? Looks like we are. I'll, everyone, please say aye if you're in favor of passage of the Karen Paul Amendment. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? That passes unanimously, and those changes have been made. Um, are we ready to vote on the resolution? Looks like we are. All those in favor of the resolution as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Item 7.10 has been, uh, was removed from the consent agenda, but has been also pulled from the agenda and will be brought up at the next meeting. So that mo may moves us on to number eight, committee reports. Any committee chair that would like to report to the council on committee activity? Hearing none. <laughs> Hearing none, Councillor Tracy. So um, we had a, as I'm um, reporting as two, a chair of two committees, the, the um, charter change committee, we're gonna need, we are at work on the conflicts of interest policy. We, however, will have to reschedule our Wednesday meeting um, in order to make sure that all counselors can be present. It's important to me that all counselors can be present for that, so we're gonna reschedule that one. We will, however, be having a TUC meeting next week on uh, Thursday the 25th uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, down at Pine Street, and we're still developing the agenda on that. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Any other committee chair? Hearing none, we will close out number eight, go to number nine, city councillors on general city affairs. Any councillor on general city affairs? Hearing none, number nine is city council uh, 
president. And my one update that I have is that um, on reg in regard to the special committee that we've formed on uh, police issues, I am appointing Councillor Shannon and Councillor Freeman to that committee. So appreciate both of your willingness to serve on that committee. Uh, and we'll finish out the evening with item number 11, Mr. Mayor on General City Affairs. Mr. Mayor, bring us home. Thank you, President Wright. Um, hope everyone is enjoying their summer. Um, it's a full month before we meet again. Um, just a couple notes from me uh, here tonight. One, uh, it was on the consent agenda. There was discussion at the Board of Finance tonight. I think uh, I do just want to note that we took a significant step um, towards the restructuring, reorganization of the Community and Economic Development Office with the creation tonight of a new position for uh, Assistant Director for Community Works. Um, this is uh, really an, an attempt using non-general uh, fund resources, not adding to the tax burden to add to the capacity in CEDO, allow it to better um, uh, address its uh, full wide range of responsibilities and mission. And um, I, I really welcome the council's support in finding an innovative way to do this. And we will be posting the job description tomorrow and, and uh, it's a key role for the city. If anyone has any ideas for us, we would welcome uh, references. Um, and then finally, I just want to point out uh, before we meet again, the Festival of Fools will, will occur uh, out on Church Street in the downtown. It's uh, really become a, a wonderful annual event led by our Burlington City Arts Department. And I hope, uh, I hope the public will come out and enjoy it this year. And it uh, promises, I, to hear from Doreen, it is going to be the best edition of it yet. So I hope, uh, hope we'll see big crowds out there. President Wright, that's what I got for tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Need a motion to adjourn, and everybody have a great rest of the month, and we'll see you in August. Motion by Councillor Roof to adjourn, seconded by Councillor Hansen. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned until August.